closely associated with quantum communication uh, you know this uh, you know this part of government of india through CDAC things are being implemented so now i request anita to take over the session thank you sir thank you for this very kind introduction so uh, so first i would like to thank you sir again for uh, and your team for giving me this opportunity um, and um, as Professor Panigrahi said, um, my guide, Professor Anirban Patak, had introduced me to him. It was at that time when the quantum community in India was very small. And uh, Professor uh, Panigrahi is, is a very humble person. He's very kind. He's very generous in, in pouring out knowledge to his students. And um, he has a very nice flair of understanding of different aspects of quantum uh, information science, be it quantum foundations, be it quantum optics experiments, communication, and computing as well. So he's a. Uh, it was. It, it's. I'm really fortunate, sir, to to having learned uh, so many things from you. Thank you. Now, <laughs> so, and now, sir, uh, this event. Uh, uh, it's a. It's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, I believe that this. This gives us all of us uh, who are there in the um, in the panel. It gives us an opportunity, both as a serving as a, a you know tool for motivation, and also creating opportunities from industry R and D organization as well as uh, from the uh, student uh, perspective. So um, so so we are again here so that you know we believe that we'll be able to be a very important player in in carving out and building and expanding national quantum ecosystem. Um, so when we were discussing about the profiles of the speakers, um, so what we could uh, bring here are very few of them. There are so many people who are working on different aspects of quantum technology in India. And um, apart from academia, there are R&D organizations like uh, ISRO and uh, Department of Telecommunications, CDOT is there, CDAC is also working, BARC is also working on that. So there are different verticals uh, from the government sides who are working on this, pursuing the case, and as well as there are so many startups startups which has come out from very experienced people who, who works on associated technology, not in depth of, about the technology, um, there are startups which has been which has sprung out from from uh, from students um, and you know which does necessarily does not need an infrastructure but can be started off as solving a particular problem which is useful to the industry. So it's a very exciting session and we should have these sessions frequently. I think for every conferences in India. So this kind of interaction which actually enable the students to plan their journey ahead and also help us understand what are the you know because students are actually the resources. I won't take much of this time, so I'll request uh, Mr. Ayan to kindly uh, introduce our first speaker. Um, uh, he's my colleague and, and a very good friend, uh, uh, Mr. Atul Guptaji from CDOT. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so I am Ayan. I am one of the program coordinators of QITP. So it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Arun Kumar. He has more than 30 years of experience in the design and development of optical communication based products. Uh, he has also worked on design of synchronous digital hierarchy based systems, filter access optical amplifiers, gigabit capable passive optical network, dense wavelength, uh, division multiplexing equipment, quantum key distribution QKD. And now he is currently designated as head of optical technologies at CDOT. So I would request Mr. Atul Gupta to start the session. Thank you. Yeah, very good afternoon. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir, yes, you are audible. Okay. I just share my screen. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir, we are able to see your screen. You may uh, enter into the full screen mode. Yeah, it's not in full screen mode only. Oh, no, actually, it's it's just showing itself. You can present you have to start presenting your slide. I think. Yeah. Thanks. Is it okay? Uh, are you able to see it now? We are able to see the means uh, PPT uh, index. We are not able to see the slideshow. You you have to means I think if you start your slideshow, it would be better. 
Yeah, but I am sharing the slide, uh, sharing the screen. You are not uh, able to see the change in the slides. No, sir. No. Go into, you can go into the slides no more. That will help us see it in full screen. It's on the top toolbar. Is it better now? Are you able to see now? Uh, we don't hey. see the change though. So, yes, sir. So, you can try one thing. You can uh, click that from beginning option present on your top left corner. Oh, left, left. From beginning, yeah. Uh, you are able to see this slide, na? quantum key distribution at C dot? Yeah, yeah, we can see that. Yeah. Now is it changing? No, no, it's not changing. Can you change it? Yeah, I, I have changed it. No, sir, it's not changing. Uh, so there may be an issue with the slideshow uh, mode. Uh, if, if we can do without the slideshow, if we can uh, change the slides. Yeah. Yeah, it is changing now. No, yeah. So you you may continue in this mode. Okay, okay, okay. Very good afternoon to everyone and thanks for this opportunity. Uh, so I will be just uh, very briefly talking about uh, what we are doing at C dot in the area of quantum key distribution. So uh, very quickly, uh, I will just give a brief background about Center for Development of Telematics C dot because uh, many in the audience may not be aware about it. So CDOT was established in 1984 as an autonomous telecom R&D center. Uh, it functions under the Department of Telecommunications of the Ministry of Communications, Government of India. So we have offices in uh, New Delhi and Bangalore. And uh, total uh, strength of CDOT is now more than 1,500. And most of them, uh, majority of them are engineers. And uh, CDOT is certified at uh, level 5 maturity in the uh, uh, CMMI model. The main uh, focus of CDOT uh, so far has been in uh, bridging the digital divide in, uh, in the rural areas and uh, enabling all the rural areas to have uh, good quality broadband connectivity. That is the recent in the past CDOT has worked towards uh, establishing telephone exchanges in the rural areas. Uh, CDOT's uh, rural automatic exchange was very popular and they are still in service although they were Deployed in late 1980s. Focus is uh, more on uh, engineers R&D in the field of optical communications, core access, quantum communication, switching, wireless, uh, 4G, 5G, Wi-Fi, etc. Network security and management. So I think uh, all of you uh, must have read newspaper reports about uh, BSNLs 4G being deployed by TCS, in which the one of the main element, which is the core network, comes from the C dot. So this is just a brief background uh, uh, to introduce CDOT. Now, uh, moving to the uh, uh, topic of the day, uh, let us briefly see that uh, in the telecom networks that we deploy, uh, cryptography is uh, very commonly used to encrypt the uh, traffic so that uh, it cannot be, you know, any adversary or eavesdropper is not able to access the traffic because a lot of the traffic that is carried is sensitive in nature and uh, it, it can be financial data, it can be defense data, it can be some strategic information, it can be some uh, banking related or pharmaceutical or health records, etc. So they have to be kept confidential. So cryptography is uh, the mainstay of the telecom networks in whatever form, be it optical networks or wireless networks or anything like that. And cryptography is typically divided into two verticals, which is symmetric key cryptography and asymmetric or public key cryptography. So in symmetric key cryptography, essentially the uh, key that is used for encryption and decryption is same. In asymmetric, uh, these keys are different. One is the public key, which is used for encryption, and the other one is the private key, which is used for decryption. So the, the way it works is that uh, symmetric key uh, 
in symmetric key cryptography one needs to periodically change the key to uh, keep the message confidential otherwise the key is kept same for a very long period then uh, the encryption itself loses its purpose and uh, then the problem boils down that in a symmetric key cryptography how the keys can be distributed between the transmitter and receiver so that both both are frequently getting updated otherwise uh, uh, otherwise there is no point in actually uh, i mean uh, the so, so, sort of key distribution becomes a problem to solve key distribution in symmetric key cryptography uh, what is usually done is to use public key cryptography so that public key cryptography establishes a channel through which the symmetric key flows from one side to the other the keys are distributed now uh, with the advancement in quantum computers this is the uh, asymmetric cryptography is at risk because it is based on certain mathematical assumptions so this uh, geopardas is the whole security of the transport network the uh, the communication network so once the keys are not secure then the data which is encrypted encrypted with those keys are also not is also at risk so to circumvent this uh, quantum key distribution uh, is gaining popularity it it basically allows a method through which keys can be distributed without any mathematical assumption so it, uh, those keys distribution takes place with security which is guaranteed by the fundamental laws of physics and any attempt of eavesdropping uh, actually change is is noticed so one is aware that now eavesdropping is taking place which is not there with conventional uh, systems so qkd offers what is known as information theoretic security it is assumption free and mathematically secure keys if we see the commercial aspects then uh, uh, there are reports which indicate that uh, the deployment of qkd globally is going to pick up and is expected to touch around Uh, more than 3 billion us dollars by 2030 uh, another important uh, fact uh, which ibm uh, brought out is that uh, the data breach uh, has a significant cost associated with it so average cost of a single data breach is uh, of the order of uh, 4 million dollars now a lot of data breaches ac actually go unreported but this is what is the average cost per data breach so data breach has a significant impact on 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 the service provider or whoever is responsible for that so uh, these two things when put together indicates that there is a growing trend towards ensuring full proof security another uh, very common attack that is uh, nowadays uh, getting popular is the harvest now decrypt later attack in which the data can be stored now and can be decrypted later on and so uh, so qkd also ensures that uh, even harvest now decrypt later attack is uh, is not of uh, generated and distributed using the quantum key distribution so these are the challenges with the present day cryptography uh, uh, the intrusions remain undetectable and the security is based on belief and is not unconditional brute force att attacks are uh, are a possibility with increase in the computing power and uh, asymmetric cryptography itself is slower than equivalent uh, symmetric cryptography because it it is based on uh, uh, one way mathematical functions so now uh, a bit about the point to point qkd system i think all all are aware that qkd essentially is point to point to begin with and uh, we have two modules which are connected through uh, some medium usually it is optical fiber or free space or it can be satellite as well and there is a quantum channel and there is a classical channel interconnecting the qkd module so one acts as a transmitter usually known as ls node and the other one acts as a uh, receiver known as the bob node all that do is that they generate identical pure symmetric keys simultaneously at two locations which are then given to the Uh, encryptor on one side and the decryptor on the other side so uh, whatever data is being uh, transported from one end to the other end gets encrypted by a key which is generated at one end and the similar key is available at the other end for the data earlier these keys are getting generated using asymmetric cryptography and which was prone to you know attack by quantum computers now that problem gets solved once qkd comes into picture the keys are secure any eavesdropping which takes place on the quantum channel gets noticed 
the solution is designed in such a way that even if the eavesdropper is able to read what is going on the classical channel still the key information is not uh, is not leaked out so the keys are absolutely secure uh, and uh, so the whatever encrypted data is flowing on the network even if somebody is able to uh, is able to store it uh, the same cannot be decrypted later on from a point to point link the qkd will get transported into a, in a network topology because in a telecom it's never point to point it is it supports different topologies whether it is a ring topology or a star or a mesh topology so qkd can also span multiple you know uh, uh, multiple uh, uh, support multiple topologies and uh, through using key relays so this diagram is taken from the itut international telecommunication union standard uh, y.38 Zero zero. So it talks about the quantum relay points, the quantum uh, trusted nodes. So till the relay points mature, it is the trusted node which will be there at intermediate location where the key relay takes place. And ultimately, the keys can be delivered at any two locations. Identical keys can be delivered with intermediate trusted node in between them. So this is how uh, C dot's uh, QKD solution, what has been developed by C dot, looks like. We have two nodes which are essentially uh, Alice and Bob uh, in 2U form factors. It's, uh, it's like it's basically compatible with the standard telecom rack that is usually used in the networks. And when we test our equipment, we test it in the in the uh, lab with actual fibers, not using uh, attenuator. So uh, actual fibers making for the quantum channel and classical channel. In terms of protocol, we support uh, differential phase shift as well as coherent one way. So these are some of the these are some of the things that uh, we have uh, uh, we are doing in the area of QKD. So uh, whatever hardware and software development uh, is required for QKD has been done in house by C dot, and a lot of uh, work goes on in the key distillation engine. Which runs in a field programmable gate array, so that has also been designed in house by C dot. In terms of performance, we have got good performance from for the key rate as well as for the quantum bit error rate, and we have tested it for over more than 100 kilometer of actual fiber. Uh, C dot is working on other solutions like routers and post quantum cryptography equipment, so we have integrated that with QKD to have a complete end to end solution. Uh, the first trial that we did was in an army network between Chandi Mandir and Kasoli in December 2021. Uh, after that, we have also installed one uh, QKD link uh, in JP Institute of Information Technology that is used for academic research purpose. And more recently, we have uh, in, uh, we have actually commissioned a link between Sanchar Bhavan, which is the headquarters of Department of Telecommunications, and National Informatics Center. at CGO complex in Delhi since February 2023. So uh, the Sanchar Bhavan is actually getting the uh, connectivity from CGO complex. So whatever information is coming there is getting encrypted by uh, keys generated using this QKD equipment. So we also uh, have come out with a scheme to multiplex the quantum channel on the same fiber, which is carrying 100 uh, Gbps of data. So this uh, this solves to some extent the problem which is associated with uh, you, with the availability of dark fiber for quantum channel, uh, which which is uh, an issue because fibers are getting exhausted uh, due to an increase in demand. A couple of patents also we have filed and one patent has been granted in uh, uh, almost a year back. So this uh, gives more detail about how QKD can work over the existing uh, fiber which are carrying data. Traditionally, uh, QKD is always uh, deployed uh, with dark fiber for the quantum channel because of the, uh, you know, the uh, power at power which it carries. And but that's a problem because uh, getting fiber at many places is, is an issue. So what we did is that since we have a 100 gig, uh, 100 Gbps uh, uh, transmission equipment, we multiplexed. Uh, the data of that along with the quantum channel and the classical channel of the QKD on a single fiber. So in one direction, it carries three wavelengths, which includes the quantum channel wavelength as well. And the other direction, uh, since the quantum channel is unidirectional, the other direction, it carries two wavelengths for the classical channel as well as the 100 gig data. Uh, 
so the real problem comes when the quantum channel is actually put along with uh, the other channels which are carrying high power so we we have uh, come out with a scheme using multiplexers demultiplexers filters and amplifiers to support uh, this particular uh, configuration although the distance get reduced but for shorter spans it is certainly a viable option uh, and for brownfield applications where the traffic is already uh, is already there on the fiber we can customize the solution to support such type of deployment so this gives some uh, link how the link looks like between the sanchar bhavan and the nic headquarters in delhi so we have a qkd transmitter the alice note at sanchar bhavan and the bob note at the nic headquarters there is a fiber dark fiber is being used here for the quantum channel and there is another fiber which is carrying the data as well as the classical channel of the qkd and uh, we have also deployed a router from uh, c dot at both locations which is taking the key and the data is then getting encrypted with the keys generated by qkd on both sides as well as decrypted also because it's a bidirectional link and you can see the photo figure uh, photo of a live qkd system at sanchar bhavan where the system is deployed in a 19 inch rack and there is a uh, graphical user interface for seeing the performance of the system so this uh, this diagram may not be uh, readable but it just shows that uh, total there are three fibers one for quantum channel and another fiber for the classical channel as well as the data one direction and the third fiber is for the other direction of the classical channel and data so typically the applications of quantum key distribution uh, is envisaged in uh, government strategic networks in telecom defense banking and financial service industries one major vertical where uh, qkd is projected to have uh, uh, quite sizable deployment in future uh, pharmaceuticals etc this is how the uh, we plan to upgrade because the link that has been commissioned between sanchar bhavan and uh, nic headquarters will eventually be expanded to cover other strategic offices in delhi so uh, at at location where in at a particular office site uh, the qkt gets installed at the egress or ingress point where the traffic is uh, you know leaving or entering the premises and that uh, gets encrypted using the Uh, keys which are generated by QKD. Similarly, this uh, topology can span out to multiple sites uh, as as and when the fiber uh, availability is there. Another important uh, point is that uh, IDOT International Telecommunication is uh, Union is now actively pursuing standardization of QKD. So we have a lot of uh, recommendations already there. from itu in the area of qkd and uh, more work is getting done and more and more recommendations are coming out so this is definitely an indication that uh, telecom fraternity is going to pick up in uh, in future now uh, from itu we understand that uh, although qkd as such looks like a point to point but to give a shape to qkd as a network uh, we have uh, intermediate nodes where the key relays can take place then there is a concept of qkd and controller as well as qkd and manager to manage the complete qkd network because uh, from a service provider point of view is deploying qkd it is very difficult to manage individual links so they want uh, any service provider would like to have a uh, clear view consolidated view of the entire qkd network which it is uh, managing where the keys are getting generated what links are operating at uh, which uh, uh, quantum bit error rate is there any eavesdropping taking place or not so all this consolidated inter, uh, information is required at one place so uh, th there is a layer above the qkd uh, basic qkd which is shown in the blue boxes here there is a layer of the key manager qkd and controller qkd and manager to uh, so there is lot of software effort there is lot of networking effort that goes besides the uh, basic qkd uh, uh, point to point system so uh, this slide i have already covered that uh, integration of qkd uh, network with the telecom network qkd will essentially be an overlay over the existing telecom network supplying keys as and where required and uh, to cover large spans there will be intermediate trusted nodes
so uh, what uh, idot specifies is that different type of scenarios in which the keys will be passed from one location to another there 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 can be a scenario the type one scenario in which the key relay is taking place at intermediate node but the actual keys are there at the end nodes only a and d so and then there are scenarios in which the keys are being delivered at all the intermediate nodes as well as passed further down the line so all the at location b and c also the keys are getting relayed to the uh, to the equipment which is using them for encryption and decryption and the third can be a mixed scenario in which there are at some nodes like b there is only key relay taking place and at c the key relay takes place as well as uh, the delivery of the key to the uh, application entity takes place so this is already covered i believe now another important point that i would like to highlight is about the collaborative development that is uh, now uh, coming through c dot Uh, so we have a policy called C dot collaborative research program through which we have we have actually come out with certain problem statements where uh, startup, second me, and industry can participate and uh, and submit proposals which can be funded by C dot to uh, to develop uh, more solutions in this area and uh, which are at higher uh, technology readiness level. The purpose is that uh, uh, it reduces the time to market and it expedites the development. so this is one opportunity where uh, collaboration can be done with c dot then uh, a quantum alliance is being pursued where uh, the effort is that instead of uh, you know individually solving problems and maybe reinventing the wheel we can come all together and uh, expedite the pace at which the development takes place we already have mou with uh, some of the leading uh, institutes in india as well as uh, with the institute of for development and research in banking technology for both qkd as well as pqc pqc is post quantum cryptography in which uh, cdot is also working so finally to uh, summarize the security of uh, the data which is transported by telecom network is uh, under threat because of the rapid advancements in the area of quantum computing a 5g will bring a lot of industry automation lot of uh, critical services and that will aggravate the problem so qkd is one way to go to provide information theoretic security so there is plenty of scope and i think a collaborative approach will be the best one to uh, take this forward and recently union cabinet has approved the national quantum mission and uh, cdot intends to play a leading role in the quantum communication vertical with this uh, i think the talk is over thank you very much Uh, thank you thank you uh, mr atul thank you a lot i think it was a very um, very well presented and uh, so many ideas you have discussed i'm sure there will be a lot of I, i i think there are a lot of questions as well for you um for sure so ayan would you like to coordinate this question answer session yes ma'am so there are i think a lot of questions so the first question is that how many kilometers of distance this these experiments were conducted from neeraj uh, you mean the for the qkd solution yeah yeah so we have tested in the lab we have tested for uh, 140 kilometers on the quantum channel okay uh, another question is, is this uh, was this photonic uh, transduction no i think i think this question is incomplete so another question is that what what is dark fiber so dark fiber actually dark fiber is the fiber which is uh, not carrying any traffic so normally when the fiber is deployed it has uh, you know it is actually the cable which uh, with lot of fibers so let's say 48 core fiber cable means that there are 48 fiber strand inside one cable not all of them are getting used some are lying uh, you know uh, without any traffic in it so that is a dark fiber which is not carrying any traffic okay so the next question is are you using quantum uh, repeaters in this fiber network no so uh, there are no quantum repeaters there are intermediate relay trusted nodes which are relays which are essentially uh, the transmitter and receiver put together because quantum repeaters are not yet there 
Okay, so I think we have no more questions. Um, thank no, you. there is a question. There is a question Achha, from okay. Doctor Modani. He asks for post processing QKD procedure. Are you using source algorithm or any other algorithm? Uh, for which one? For post processing QKD procedure. So we, uh, the, the, uh, if I understand correctly, it is basically the key distillation procedure. Uh, uh, I think it's related to the key distillation procedure. So the classical channel is a authenticated channel. And then we uh, carry out the uh, error correction as well as privacy amplification. There is no Shor's algorithm uh, involved there. Okay. Many participants are actually posting their question writing in the chat. I'll ask them to, you can, uh, participants to unmute themselves and ask the questions directly to the speakers. That way you can get your answer and clarify all the doubts. That will be the most efficient. The participants, can you please unmute yourself and ask questions to Prof. Mr. Gupta directly? Yeah, I have a question. Like, uh, ITU has recommended a lot of standards, and uh, are they working? on upper layers like uh, after physical layers or quantum layers uh, uh, are they working on some kind of firmware or software also uh, as a sample programs uh, you mean itu yeah itu so itu the objective is that uh, to basically uh, ensure that there is no vendor locking so nice. they are coming out with specifications for the layers like the key management layer the QKDN network layer, the controller layer, uh, to basically make it sort of, uh, you know, uh, to give the functionality, which is traditionally uh, known as FCAP, so fault management, the performance management, administration, et cetera, configuration. So that is the intent. The, the uh, lowest layer remains the quantum layer where the actual qubits are traveling and the keys are generated. But uh, it is basically all the, you know, layers around that that ITU is working on. They are not prescribing any particular uh, mechanism of key uh, distribution, like any particular protocol, but uh, uh, they are giving standards from uh, keeping the network in view. Uh, they, they, they won't give any solution as such, they are the standards. So. Any other participants who wants to ask questions? Um, hello, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you, sir, for the session. Uh, just I want to know, like uh, the relays that you mentioned before, like when I asked uh, whether to use quantum repeaters or not. So I just want to know, do they deal with classical communication bits or just uh, qubits? Like because for qubits, you need to use uh, repeaters, right? Yeah, so uh, basically the... Uh, 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 the problem comes when uh, we have to uh, go for higher higher distances or the span length is higher. So intermediately, uh, one has to put a trusted node, which is essentially a receiver followed by a transmitter. So all that the quantum channel is terminated, that trusted node, the keys are generated and then relayed on the onto the new span. So there is no quantum repeater as such. These are trusted nodes with the uh, the functionality to sort of uh, receive the signal, generate the keys, and then uh, send it again on the next pen. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, so, are there any more questions? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, we can move to the next speaker now, uh, and uh, we can have uh, some some space at the end, perhaps, where we can take more questions. We are running late, actually. Yeah, yeah, that would be better, I guess. Okay. So let us thank Mr. Atul Kumar Gupta for this wonderful session, and uh, moving ahead, um, I would like to introduce our next speaker.
So, Mr. Adarsh Jain, are you around? Yeah, I can see him. Yes. Uh, yeah, I am here. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay, thank you. So, let me introduce. Uh, Mr. Atul Kumar Gupta, you can unshare your screen actually. Sure, I'll do that. Yeah. In the meantime, let me introduce uh, Mr. Adarsh Jain. Currently, he is heading the Quantum Systems and Technology Division, QSTD at IS ISRO, and working towards the development of state of the art quantum technologies for demonstrating India's first satellite based QKD between two Indian ground stations. In early 2021, he led a team and successfully demonstrated India's first NAVIC synchronized fully automated free space QKD systems between two buildings inside SAC campus, along with quantum secured video board. He then led the development of various new technologies for optical and microwave photonic systems. Um, his areas of expertise include optical communication, microwave photonics, and quantum communication technologies. He joined ISRO in 2007, and he did his graduation in electronics and communication engineering. So I would like uh, Mr. Adas Jain to take over the session and start sharing his screen. Are you able to see the slides now? Hello? Yeah, yeah, we can see. Okay. Uh, so at the outset, uh, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Anandita and QIQT team to invite me for the for this talk. Uh, very good afternoon, all of you. So uh, doc, uh, Mr. Atul from CDET has already uh, introduced about the quantum communication and uh, very beautifully he has described. So I'm directly switching on to the satellite based quantum communication, which we are working on here at Space Application Center Ahmedabad. So uh, this is the slide already very well described by uh, Atulji. So I'm just skipping this thing introduction for the interest of time. So uh, as Atulji has mentioned, the uh, fiber-based QKD is uh, limited to only a few hundreds of kilometer, like he has set up to 140 kilometer, he has demonstrated the fiber-based QKD and beyond that, the absorption uh, in the fiber becomes dominant and you won't be able to receive any photons. Like effectively, the key rates goes to uh, uh, very benign, it goes to zero. So if we want to, uh, uh, increase the distance or we want to do the larger distance QKD, then at present satellite is the only solution because quantum repeaters and all those things are not at all available and they are under development. So uh, typically if we say the like over the 100 kilometer of the, if the loss of the fiber is let us say 0.2 dB to 0.3 dB per kilometer, then we, uh, after 100 or 120 kilometer, the loss goes to uh, more than 20 dB. But similar kind of performance with the satellite can be obtained with the LEO orbit. When the satellite is situated around 500 kilometer orbit, then similar kind of losses, even with the 500 kilometer satellite would be able to compensate. So if you want to do the uh, QKD or quantum communication between two ground stations situated thousands of kilometer apart, then we can use the satellites and we can distribute the keys and it could be the intercontinental distribution also. And uh, China has, uh, in 2016-17, successfully demonstrated the, demonstrated the quantum key distribution between two ground stations uh, separated by more than thousands of kilometer apart. And also, they have demonstrated the, between China and Australia the live quantum encrypted video quality. So because the antenna gains here, because the, here we are dealing with the uh, uh, optical frequencies, means two, close to 200 of terahertz, frequency you are using. So the gain of the optical telescopes is substantially high. And similarly at the ground station also, we are using larger aperture telescopes of the order of one meter. 
so uh, the free space path loss of the beam can be compensated by the uh, by the telescope gains and only the atmosphere which is around 15 to 20 km that is coming coming into uh, coming into the our path and even with the slant range of around maybe 1200 km the atmosphere uh, this uh, atmospheric path length can go as high as only 25 km so that way if any, any kind of uh, any kind of perturbations with respect to atmosphere these can be very well handled at the ground and this will not be uh, significant in terms of the losses between uh, losses of the signal so we at uh, sac usually space application center is uh, uh, is a very uh, well known center of the isro i don't need to tell about it so but anyway uh, the space application center we are mainly dealing with the two kinds of payload one is the communication payload where we work on the microwave frequency and optical frequencies where we have all all the gsat kind of series uh, geostationary communication satellites are there which provide kind of multiple applications like dts services and other kind of communication services another field the remote sensing payload where we do the imaging of our uh, earth so based on these can be captured again at my, microwave and optical domain where you can see synthetic aperture radar based and camera all these payloads are comes under this category so uh, for quantum technology for quantum communication what are the these are the some of the major technology or critical technology needed to achieve this uh, satellite based quantum communication or satellite based qkd first of all we need one quantum transmitter because all these technologies and quantum communication technologies would require single generation of the stream of single photons along with the quantum receiver technology means you need to have very high sensitive single photon detectors to that would be able to detect the even a presence of a single photon event along with that we need timing and synchronization because for communication there is no physical link between uh, satellite and the ground station so both are remotely located then and timing synchronization what instant you are transmitting the photon and what instant you are receiving the photon at the ground so both the time event has to be properly timed and synchronized so that to have uh, to minimize the error otherwise if there is a some kind of offset between these events uh, we will not be able to get any proper information it will be totally in the error along with that we need uh, implementation of the qkd protocol which broadly can be classified into two categories one is a prepare and measure kind measure kind of protocol based on the uh, probabilistic single photon sources and uh, another one is the entangled protocols which are like b91 and uh, e91 and bbm92 kind of protocols another important parameter if we do the free space communication between satellite to ground then you need to properly model the atmosphere and along with that noise model is also needed because uh, noise is becoming very dominant at this uh, communication because the detectors are highly sensitive so even if there any stray light or background light is coming your detector is going to give you the some outcome and you need to be and you are supposed to distinguish between that kind of spurious event and the real signal event so those 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 kind of proper modeling is needed and you you need to identify the ground station location based on the atmospheric studies and the noise models that we need to develop along with that important parameter uh, important technology is the as it's a line of sight communication and the satellite is moving like leo orbit uh, we cannot go beyond leo orbit because the losses in the geo orbit is typically 36000 km is very high so with that geo stationary orbit we would not be able to communicate anything with the ground station so then we need to restrict it to the leo orbit with the uh, at at present with the currently available technology but however the leo satellite is keep it, keep on moving orbiting the earth so typically the uh, the orbit uh, uh, duration is of 90 minutes so within 90 minutes it is going to completely orbit the earth so that uh, and now with the moving platform you, you need to continuously establish the contact with the ground station and the beams are very narrow divergent beam so the typical footprint is of the order of 10 to 20 meter at the ground station so you need to continuously point towards the uh, station and you need to track the satellite so that kind of pointing acquisition tracking mechanism has to be implemented with the uh, satellite as well as ground station and then here uh, there uh, the classical link at, at the ground uh, terrestrial networks we can use the already available internet links or ethernet cable, uh, links but with the satellite to ground rs link we need to use as a classical link for to execute the qkd protocol 
so uh, this is the some of the baseline technologies for uh, uh, in detail like quantum transmitter uh, uh, sources can be as of now with the if you want to do the experimental experiment then at present the solution is to develop the weak coherent pulse source which is what we have done it and uh, at present we are uh, uh, working for that kind of protocols only because here you need to generate the classical optical pulses and you can attenuate those pulses to such an extent that on and off they become single photon per pulse so uh, the distribution becomes poissonian distribution and it becomes probabilistic single photon source and the mean photon number we have to set such that uh, it should not the the multi photon even has to be uh, suppressed to the extent possible then other class of sources which are ideal are, are kind of deterministic single photon sources which are still under development where the photon can be generated on demand like if i want 100 photon per second then i should be able to generate that kind of thing but still those kind of sources are not at yet available and another class of uh, uh, sources are entangled photons which are which are generating the entangled photon pairs so the entanglement could be in the form of proportion degree of freedom so these are the uh, few uh, uh, popular popular sources which are being used in this technology for coming to the quantum receiver here we need the very high sensitivity single photon detector so if you are counting the pulses then it becomes single photon counting model with associated electronics then it will give you the if the one photon in incident it will give you the one uh, digital pulses so you can count the pulses and then you can estimate the number of incident photon so the at two popularly used wavelength at this qkd is one is the 800 nanometer wavelength another one is the 1550 nanometer wavelength so the single silicon based photodiodes are available with very uh, high efficiencies of up to maybe 70% at uh, 800 nanometer wavelength but however same diode similar kind of diode with gall gallium arsenide technology is having very limited efficiency of around 10 to 20% So at 1550 nanometer, if you want to go for satellite to ground experiment with the high efficiency sources are needed, then there is another technology which is known as superconducting nanowire SPDs are available. As an SPD technology, we need to move on to. Then it is based on the uh, here the detectors are cooled at a cryogenic temperature to achieve the high quantum efficiencies. Another technology is quantum receiver is the polarization compensation because if you are dealing with the linearly polarized polarized light from the satellite and you are then the with the movement of the platform with the movement of the satellite then the frame of reference when it reaches to the ground station is keep on changing so then that uh, transmitted frame frame of reference is continuously to be tracked and then compensated for any change in polarization. then another technology is the time tagging and synchronization which is also very important so here we need to use either gps or navig based synchronization uh, because these type of uh, 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 receivers are giving one one pulse per second signal based on that our clocks can be synchronized to using gps and navig signal and on other side for achieving better synchronization or time synchronization we need to use one optical beacon so uh, that with the with the Uh, in synchronization with the quantum signal so with that also timing synchronization can be achieved and then the tdcs can be used for time tag tagging the events and coincident detector is required for the uh, entanglement based protocol because they are the both the photons are coming together and then you have to within a certain coincidence window you have to determine the coincidence of these two photons to come uh, then to verify the performance of visibility or quantum entanglement then some of the protocols already discussed like this can be categorized into prevent measures and entanglement based protocol but the entanglement based protocol the uh, the uh, generation rate is limited to few millions of photons per second then these these uh, so rate at which the entanglement photons are generated are not sufficient enough to have any significant key rate between satellite to ground so now this uh, technology has to be improved to maybe few hundreds of millions per second then it can be really useful for the satellite to ground qkd experiment so uh, experiments then pat is the another technology is where you need to develop the mechanism so that continuously you should be able to track the satellite with the ground station and then uh, different type of drive mechanisms are needed means you need to gimbal is needed so that you would be able to azimuth you need to control the azimuth and elevation angle of the onboard telescope as well as ground telescope then different kind of drive mechanisms along with their associated electronics is, is needed and then comes to the optics part you need to telescope is nothing but the optical antenna then you need uh, 
to develop the telescope and associated optical elements so that uh, 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 the beam can be transmitted from the satellite and it should and we would be able to receive it at the ground terminal and then along with the atmosphere channel modeling is also very important because you need to identify you need to place you need to identify lo locations of the ground station so you would not want to place it where like there is a cloudy weather and first you need to analyze the performance over the year if it, at least it should be uh, beyond certain threshold like 80 90% availability you need to ensure before investing to the optical ground stations coming to the uh, system level technologies sbqc like uh, single photon based or probabilistic single photon based qkd system we have developed weak current pulse sources here at sac and we have demonstrated end to end bb84 protocol based qkd system over 300 meter of free space atmospheric channel and various technology it was the fully automated automated demonstration and various technologies we have validated uh, in this experiment similarly entangled based qkd system uh, also we have demonstrated in free space and it was in collaboration with the physical research laboratory ahmedabad and that qkd using over moving platform because now if it is a satellite you want to emulate before moving to the satellite you want to create certain moving platform here at ground like then some kind of drone based uh, experiment can be planned for that uh, to validate the performance of the moving platform based uh, moving platform based qkd then one of the payload we are working at, as of now is the quantis payload we are in a loop back mode means we, we want to validate the performance uh, uh, of our own developed entangled photon source in in space and then uh, then uh, we want to the entangled photons will be generated on board the payload and there only we are putting some det detectors and then through telemetry we would be able to uh, validate the performance how this entanglement phenomena is going to perform in space or what and so certain other uh, experiment we would be able to do in space and then development of optical ground station is also very important and suitable location has to be identified so that uh, uh, signal can be received at the ground station and key can be distributed between multiple ground station and another our major main goal is towards the development of the satellite based quantum communication technology and so we are working for the payload development that is going to have a, a link between satellite to ground station so coming to the recent advances in satellite based quantum communication is the uh, it all it started uh, because bb84 protocol was proposed in 1984 by two researcher bennett and gressard and they proposed this protocol in iisc bangalore itself but till um, till 2000 or 2005 not, not much hardware or devices were available in the market so the all major experimentation and major uh, research has been reported since 2005 onwards and major breakthrough happened in between uh, last five year to th up 2016 to 20 where china has demonstrated both kind of protocol both kind of sources from Uh, one is decoy bb84 based uh, uh, qkd protocol another one is the entanglement based protocol between satellite to ground and then china, japan has demonstrated quantum limited communication so and then lots of countries have their plan to launch the satellite uh, so as to have like uh, uh, larger distance qkd possible and uh, we are also working for the development of such satellites and we are expecting by may 2025 we would be able to launch our own satellite and uh, some of the international missions missions are like china has demonstrated this uh, uh, both kind of sources one dedicated payload they have uh, put in the satellite one is the probabilistic single photon source another one is the entangled photon source so both they have demonstrated successfully from satellite to ground uh this was the by china uh, uh this was by japan in 2016 they have demonstrated quantum limited communication it was like they at the receiver they have ensured the single the reception of the single photon but ideally for quantum communication from transmitter from satellite itself you should you ensure the transmission of the single photon event but they have transmitted quite a high number of photon from the satellite but at the receiver they have ensured because, because after certain attenuation when it reaches to ground it become single photon so this is not quantum secure but lots of technologies can be validated with these kind of experiment and this is called as a quantum limited communication 
and then singapore has uh, done in a loop back mode which uh, like quantum entanglement verification so source as well as detector they have put in a sim sim uh, small cube set and then uh, they did this experiment in space and through telemetry link through rf telemetry they have observed the performance of the uh, of the entangled photon so there was no link there was no photon link or optical link from satellite to ground in this experiment and coming to the up upcoming lots of countries have proposed uh, uh, their uh, their missions and by maybe 24 or 25 uh, they will be launching their satellites so this is the canada has planned to do do the most of the satellites are over leo orbit and they want to do the uh, for both kind of sources they want to put in the satellite and they will do the Uh, uh communication quantum key distribution between two ground station another one is the european space agency they has also planned to have this nanobob kind of uh, satellite which they are planning to have in the similar 500 km orbit at uh, 800 nanometer wavelength so this is expected to be launched in 2024 similarly canada uh, seek is the mission they want to put some Uh, on board iss they want to do certain experiment and they want to put the source and detector there itself and they want to validate the performance of some of the technologies in space and then inspector is by singapore that they with some collaboration with some of the private agencies and they also would like to launch the satellite by 2024 so coming to the development at sac isro uh, so here uh, we have demonstrated in uh, 2021 mass 21 21 interbuilding qkd experiment it was the fully automated uh, uh, fully automated interbuilding experiment we had along with the from the, one of the building we have kept our transmitter or v core and pulse of this transmitter and from over the 3 meters free space link at the another building where we have kept our receiver so you can see this is the uh, 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 this is this is the transmitter building this is from uh, our source and this is through front end optics it is being transmitted to the another building so this is the receiver building and you can see this is the front end optics which is needed to uh, collimate the beam and proper confining the beam and this is the associated fpga and the uh, polarization encoding module and the associated fpga electronics module and this is the gui which we have developed and so uh, end to end demonstration we have carried out and uh, this was the first fully automated interbuilding demonstration uh, over 300 meter distance and uh, navic based synchronization we have used and it was live we have demonstrated and along with that lots of application quantum cryptography application we have demonstrated like client to client live video conferencing image encryption text encryption and so lots of application have been demonstrated between these two building means use case scenario also have been demonstrated and uh, uh, around 300 kilobits per second is the quantum uh, key rate we have achieved in this case and quantum bit error rate was lost, less than 3% this experiment was done during uh, late evening or night so night only because this was carried out at 800 nanometers so as to avoid any ambient light this was done during night so lots of uh, this was very well reported in so many magazines and newspaper another experiment with quantum entanglement based free space uh, communication over same 300 meter uh, distance we have carried out in collaboration with the prl so you can see this is the entangled photon source developed by prl and in this uh, in this building which is the uh, which is the transmitter building we have kept one entangled photon source and one of the receiver there itself in the building separated by around 5 meter of the uh, free space channel and another photon was transmitted to the another building which was around 300 meter apart so that way the source was emitting two photons simultaneously two polarization entangled photons simultaneously and between this this uh, this is one of the receiver and another receiver both the receivers have uh, the key have been distributed between two receivers and it was based on the polarization entangled photon source so the entanglement we have observed entanglement was intact by doing certain visibility experiment and bell state experiment and then we have uh, we have executed the bbm 92 protocol and the key rate was achieved of the order around 1.8 kilobits per second with that this kind of key bits also we have demonstrated some of the application but here we have demonstrated quantum uh, uh, this uh, this seeded uh, aes1 aes256 video calling and the 256 bit was provided by this keys so this was a just comparison between these two kind of demonstration so uh, this weak core and pulse source based bbt4 protocol up to around uh, 300 to 400 kilobits around 300 kilobits we have achieved 
and with this because of the source limitation and the protocol itself the coincident detection means both the photon you will have to be received simultaneously within that coincident window those only can contribute to the key so the type of protocol and the limitation of the source it will it the it's of around two order lower the key rates around two order lower so uh, with this uh, uh, several other technologies are already been developed and uh, under some of the technologies are under development and all will finally culminate into the our end goal of the satellite based quantum communication so one of the payload that we are at present working is the quantum uh, quantum entanglement studies in space we call it as a quantis so uh, this is like in loop back more similar to the singapore mission we want to do the validate the some performance of a quantum entanglement source along with the receiver there itself and through telemetry we are validating some of the performance along with that because lots of most of the components are commercially available so how they are going to behave in vacuum environment in gravity environment that we would like to analyze the performance record the performance over a certain period of time and uh, uh, one of the experiment like hongo mandal experiment also interference experiment also we want to do it here uh, there in space itself and the uh, the data will be uh, the measurement data will be transmitted through the tele available telemetry link or rf link to the ground station then we would uh, we evaluating the performance at ground so uh, this is the this is the uh, you can see the electro opto mechanical model consisting of the polarization entangled source I mean, this is the sagnac loop based uh, elect, uh, this sagnac loop based uh, type uh, this uh, entangled photon source polarization entangled photon source this is type 0 entangled photon source in this we are developing so this is also in collaboration with this, uh, prl and this is the associated electronics model so lots of electronics is needed like single photon detectors spj detect spj electronics and piezo drive electronics because we want to do the hom experiment then you need to uh, change the phase or delay between these two arms so all things has to be automated so this is almost uh, in the final stage of development and uh, soon we will be able to launch this uh, payload in a loop back mode in one of the space craft now coming to the satellite based quantum communication so uh, this how the satellite is going to distribute the keys between two ground station in this pro, in this scheme is like first satellite is whenever the satellite comes in the visibility of a station a then they will do the establish the quantum communication link and they will distribute the key k so uh, the visibility is of the for a particular leo orbit the time is around 10 to 12 minutes so after this passes over then it will come to the visibility of the another ground station then they will establish the link uh, and they will distribute the key kb which is not equal to k and in the same pass rf link is available they will do the parity announcement means ka xor kb so when the kb you will do the xoring of k xor kb it will also it will going to get the key k so with this both the ground station going to get the key same k and then they will do use that key to encrypt the messages and then they will do the quantum secure communication so with the entanglement based protocol both the ground station going to receive the same key because the the pairs are being transmitted to the two ground station simultaneously but uh, here the visibility the satellite visibility is has to be there with the both ground station simultaneously so the 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 here the 10 to 12 minutes even reduced to the maybe 2 to 3 minutes of the duration that's why uh, that also will lead to the reduce uh, reduction in the key rate with this entanglement based protocol so our this coming to the our opto quantum communication program we are planning to have two leo satellite and one geo satellite so leo satellite is going to be operated in the downlink mode means transmitter will be putting in the uh, payload and ground station are going to have the quantum receiver so uh, two leo satellite uh, when based on the availability they will be able to uh, provide the keys to the different different ground stations so similarly when other uh, uh, payload is available in the visibility it will going to distribute the keys to the other ground station along with the quantum communication th these are going to have high data rate optical communication link also between these between these ground station and this geo is only going to have the optical communication bidirectional data link for other application where high data rate communication is required because optical and quantum the front end optics is going to remain same and both are line of sight communication so lots of things can be com combined and lots of technologies can be demonstrated simultaneously so we call it as a opto quantum communication program
so this is the typical payload uh, block diagram where you need to a uh, lots of technology you need to develop one is the like pointing acquisition tracking for that like you need to have some kind of moving mechanism either it could be gimbal based or some kind of mirror based mechanism is needed and then for fine alignment one fsm is needed to uh, compensate for the high frequency jitters and then beacon is needed for uh, for with respect to beacon we will do this all this pointing acquisition tracking analysis so similarly this rf link is needed for classical post processing of the data like basis sharing and error correction privacy amplification or this classical part we need classical rf channel so coming to the ground segment some of the technologies remain same you need to have this pad and uh, this uh, beacon but along with that polarization compensation is needed for to correct the any change in polarization with respect to the movement movement of the satellite you can see this is the already 700 mm aperture telescope ground station is available at sac amdabad so in initial experimental phase we are going to use this optical ground station to demonstrate some of the thing but eventually some a few more ground station needs to be established at a suitable location across india for like operational phase of this mission and this uh, is the at very uh, because the very highly sensitive detectors are there so proper take care of filtering is needs to be taken to avoid any stray light so spectral temporal and uh, uh, kind of filtering is needed to avoid uh, to suppress the any kind of unwanted noise which is going to uh, uh, corrupt the signal performance and similarly the lots of atmospheric studies we have carried out and we have set, uh, some set of data to identify the uh, probability of the station to be visible for conducting this experiment cloud what is the cloud free probability of a particular location and what is the transmission window or transmittance of that particular location so all this for and for system engineering all these parameters are really important to identify the location of uh, ground station across our country and finally this is to be integrated uh, satellite to grounding to be integrated with the terrestrial fiber based network to uh, to provide the end to end solutions and this is our road map road map for uh, 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 a satellite based quantum communication for initial fever we would be focusing on the prepare and measure kind of protocol and we would be launching the satellite for that that kind of uh, with that those kind of sources and eventually we will go move to the entanglement based qkd protocols also which we are currently developing are increasing the uh, uh, photon generation rate is to be increased at ground then we will uh, move on to the entanglement based uh, protocols and we will put the entanglement source at the uh, satellite itself and still there are lots of challenges are there because uh, it's a uh, uh, satellite coverage is limited so uh, as of now we cannot go beyond the leo orbit so typically 10 to 12 minutes per that like we are getting for establishing the quantum communication pointing is also very critical and efficiency needs to be increased for sources as well as detector and system operation during daytime as of now it's a very challenging because daytime lots of noise is there solar radius irradiance is very high and it is going to um, flood or maybe saturate your detector even without any signal so daytime operation is very critical and lots of challenges are there so right now we are also trying to work out the solution for that and eventually the key rates as of now satellite to ground key rates are few kilobits per second so those has to be increased to uh, at least few megabits per second so that kind of technology is required to be implemented and this uh, already uh, last speaker has covered like now standardization is there for fiber based lots of Uh, they are now in future like we need to do some kind of interoperability between the satellite uh, kind of free space to kd and satellite is to it those kind of standards are also needed and this was my last slide thank you all uh, thank you mr jain for this detailed talk uh, we would like a uh, few questions uh, we have a question in the chat from dr manjunath the question is that for satellite mission will it be a coherent source or entangled photon source so uh, right now we are going ahead with the coherent source weak coherent pulse source only as i have mentioned the uh, the the key rates are uh, with that only we will be able to receive any photons at the ground the entangled photons are limited to few uh, millions of photons per second but uh, with that hardly uh, we are going to receive any photons at ground because both the 
uh, because both the station has to be in the simultaneous visibility as well as coincident within that coincident window if you are able to detect any photon then only it will be useful so for any kind of real if you want to serve the real kind of application practical application this as of now the coherent source is the only solution available so with that we are moving ahead So, uh, as we are running out of uh, time, I would request. Uh, I I think we can take one or two questions. I request the participants to unmute themselves and ask. That would be better. Hello, sir. Hello. Yes. Hello. Sir, how can we minimize the noise in uh, sun radiation or irradiation due to sun? So, for the like the you need to do one the spectral sufficient very narrow band spectral filter you can use. Second, especially you need to minimize the field view of the receiver. So you you need to. So to block unwanted uh, radiation coming into this, that is the temporal filtering. So in post processing, you need to implement a uh, certain kind of filtering. So those kind of three type of filtering are need to uh, sufficiently suppress the uh, solar noise. But it can be done. But uh, quite challenging. But definitely, uh, people are working on it. Uh, hi, hi Adarsh. Yeah, uh, I had a question. Uh, so hi. I think yeah. Uh, so uh, with respect to the optics modules that uh, you have mentioned, right, which is going to the Leo and G orbit, can it be miniaturized to a small satellite or nano satellite payload? So uh, right now we are working on the small satellite payload. Uh, so but uh, like. Uh, At least started with half, uh, one inch or two inch kind of model, but right now we are going there with a half inch kind of, and it's going to be there with a the bulk kind of thing. But eventually, as of now, it's still there with the quite minimal. Right? Also, means the uh, because we are making their we are we uh, also are making their house and we are putting rows so that it is very correct. But eventually, few people there are certain things to report. It about the photonic integrated circuits. So in future, uh, you all, you are going to have all kind of model in a single chip. So that is the future. As now, uh, still it is quite miniaturized and uh, uh, a very very small kind of few inch few inch we can see like six by six. You would be able to make the transfer optics model. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we can move forward. as uh, so we are really running out of time so coming on to the next talk uh, it is our great pleasure to introduce uh, dr anindita banerji she is at present working as a senior scientist at cdec pune she was a visiting scholar at university of calgary and later at university of brunswick canada she received her phd from giit in noida in theoretical domains of quantum computing and communication She did her postdoc in at Bose Institute, Kolkata, where she worked on single photon experiments. She was also awarded CSIR Pool Officer in 2016. She played a key role in developing India's first quantum technology product in quantum key distribution in quantum random number generator in 2021. She was awarded a project on aerial quantum communication platform from METI. Uh, she has two us pay, pay, patents awarded and one india indian patent in quantum technology area with a previous organization where she worked as quantum research head and vp at qnu labs private limited focusing on quantum safe solutions for cyber security she has also co-authored a book on optical quantum computation and quantum communication published in spie spotlight series so without uh, further taking any time i would request dr ben dr anita ma'am to start thank you so is my slides moving i think i'm having the similar yeah you your cursor is moving and slides are also moving oh great yeah 
So yes. thank you. Thank you for this uh, kind introduction. So as uh, Mr. Ayan has uh, point, uh, you know, just mentioned that uh, we have been very recently awarded uh, a project uh, from Ministry of Information and Technology to work on um, uh, aerial quantum communication. So the project is titled as Agile and Ad Hoc Free Space Based Quantum Communication Using Drone. So um, this is how what we visualize it. Uh, and uh, it's just been a couple of months. Um, so not even a, you know six months. So we are just working on it. We are trying to find the identifying the challenges, um, uh, trying to identify the use cases, and also to understand what kind of a uh, architecture uh, this uh, you know would require. So, um, so I'm from CDAC, and CDAC has been uh, indigenously building supercomputing systems and subsystems and uh, interconnect products since, since 1988. So it uh, it uh, was born out of the uh, technology denial. Uh, you know, the, when the India was denied uh, supercomputing facilities, it was then where CDAC developed its own uh, high performance computing machines. So it's an honor to be a part of this organization. And uh, the, the uh, organization possesses in-house in -house strengths for developing hardware and software components. Uh, they are very smart uh, engineers from electronics, electrical, uh, software domain. Uh, and uh, so as you can see here that, uh, that quantum computing has been identified as one of the mission programs uh, out of the six mission programs which CDAC already has. And we are working in that direction. Now, uh, my domain is actually quantum communication uh, uh, after my uh, PhD. So before in my PhD, I was working mostly on quantum, uh, you know, quantum algorithms, synthesis of reversible circuits, designing of secure communication protocols. It was more in the theoretical domain. So I have a good idea about the quantum information, some security protocols. But it was, but it was after my PhD during my postdoctoral session where I was, uh, you know, um, I was working on some quantum optics experiments. So. So once you have a touch and feel of the subject via experiments, it kind of motivates you, inspires you, and uh, this had been, and this led to the motivated me to take this journey. Now, um, well, so uh, so a lot of the uh, the necessity of a quantum communication has been already covered by, by elegantly, very elegantly, by Mr. Atul Kumar Gupta from C dot, and Mr. Uh, Adarsh Janji from uh, uh, ISROSAC. So I will not be spending too much of a time on the on the on these basics, just to give you an you know. But, but I do have to touch upon because this is the 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 very reason why we are discussing quantum communication. It is because of this RSA two zero four eight, which uh, which is based upon the uh, factorization problem, and the quantum algorithm kind of comes up with solving this, uh, providing a solution to this problem in polynomial time. And there has been a recent paper which says that you can solve it in eight hours with 20 million qubits. Now, 20 million number changes every three to four years. And now I was talking to one of the uh, senior people in IBM, and they were saying that with recent improvisation in the error correction codes, this number is going to come down. And maybe you'll see some, some extraordinary work even in the NISC era. It, we did not go into a fault tolerant era, era as well. And there's a prediction of solving this problem in 10 seconds using 4,099 stable qubits. So I have my friends and colleagues from the quantum computing, both quantum communicate from hardware and software, which I think they will also discuss about this. Now, this is a report on the right hand side of McKinsey report, uh, December 2021, where it clearly shows that once you have logical 1,000 qubit, or a gate-based qubit, uh, you know, uh, you will be able to crack the RSA. Now, um, this is something which has been, you know, uh, predicted using theoretical papers. And now you have so much of uh, advancements in the quantum architecture, quantum hardware that this looks certainly as a as a possibility. If it'll happen, it'll be um, it will be a very big crisis moment. So it is better to gear up. And in the process, you learn the technology, uh, you are able to make some more papers some patents uh, and earn, earn. So, so it's, it's a nice thing to do. Then, um, so the problem, um, quantum communication 
tries to solve is the classical key distribution. Mr. Atulji has rightly pointed out that, you know, um, that the symmetric key distribution, it was basically, uh, if you look into the, the history of cryptography, you know, is very, very old. And, uh, and it was actually symmetric key distribution, which was taking place. But after some time due to advancement of electronics and, and, and mathematical uh, models, there came, and, and also, uh, uh, it's a very pragmatic way of, of doing cryptography, these asymmetric ones, which we're using in our day-to-day -day lives, right? But a more theoretically uh, secure, uh, more foundational will be symmetric key distribution. So now we are trying to solve the problem of classical key distribution by, by doing a quantum key distribution, which is assumed, which is not only assumed, but which is theoretically proven to be secure. That's why it's called information theoretic secure. But the implementation, the implementation is a very big challenge. Something which is secure on theory has to be implemented to to um, to very uh, to very uh, precise, very neat levels, so that you are in those thresholds. You know, so uh, then only you'll be able to securely use them. Otherwise, half big thing when when you are doing security with these half big systems, which if comes to the uh, to the ecosystem are very dangerous so there is a, a there is a very 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 you know it's a there's a need in fact that we understand the quantum information science part of the protocols we can if we can come up with some good quantum key distribution protocols um, apart from the the very few well known uh, which can give you a higher key rate even when you are trying to do it in a free space that will solve much of the problem so now we move forward. So what we are going to do talk about here is the integrated quantum communication. So it comprises of um, terrestrial as well as non-terrestrial. And I would say space, but space can also be a part of a non-terrestrial quantum network. But since it is, it is not easy to build these stations um, and also the limitation as, uh, as Mr. Uh, uh, Adarshan rightly pointed out, there's a duration and uh, the, the several factors uh, which kind of challenges your transmission rate. So, uh, so therefore, um, I think the aerial, uh, aerial uh, network, aerial quantum network is a better candidate for a non-terrestrial quantum network. So uh, with that, we move forward. This, was, this slide was to give you an idea how the entire technology has to coexist if you're talking about quantum internet or if you're talking about integrated quantum communication systems, all of them will coexist and these will pose as a relay, uh, as relay to solve the last mile quantum key exchange, maybe for intercity or, or any field network. And it will benefit the society with rapid deployment, um, cost-effective solutions, and very important, you know, it offers reconfigurability, okay? So with this, we move forward. Now, uh, our first presentation was on uh, fiber-based QKD. Um, uh, so we have heard that there is already a fiber link between Sanjar Bhavan and NIC, uh, and we are doing a DPS and a cow-based protocol over fiber using uh, telecom wavelength. And it has gone till, in fact, 140 kilometer, which is very interesting. Then uh, Mighty also has uh, done um, has done some kind of a network, you know, uh, I would say network because it's more than two nodes, uh, which they are trying to expand. There is a link between SETS Chennai and IIT Madras. It is called Makan, Metro Area Quantum Access Network. Um, then um, Q New Labs is a startup, uh, Indian startup, who also works in this domain. And uh, if you have, uh, you know, carefully looked at the, the different slides, which uh, which the first speaker was talking about. It tells you the different technologies which are required. It's not only the quantum information science, it is the implementation, and there is so many other levels of complexity, which is which comes into play when you're actually trying to deploy the system in the, um, in the field, or when you're trying to test it in a lab. Then um, Adar Janji has very nicely, elaborately, he, he brought out this, static free, free space and satellite QKD. Uh, he brought out the technological limits. He brought out the technology, uh, technological challenges, the possibilities, the, the, uh, the benchmarkings they have done with different protocols. 
he mentioned prepare and measure protocol using PB84. Then he mentioned the BBM92, uh, I think, with uh, entanglement-based protocol. And there was a very strong observation that, you know, he observed very less key rate when he was using an entangled photon source. Now, the theoreticians in, this, uh, in, the, in the audience would say, well, entanglement based protocols uh, it has much more credit from the security perspective. You know, uh, it, it uh, kind of helps you, it, you can resist the photon number splitting attack. It is uh, more secure in terms of side channels. Then there is a guarantee of the randomness or guarantee of the source because of the non-inequality tests which you are doing. So it is still, uh, you know, a um, lot of experimentations and testings and benchmarking, uh, benchmarking needs to be done. Now, Physical Research Laboratory is the lead academic institute which has been uh, working with uh, uh, with SAC on these uh, demonstrations. And then we have, and now we are, uh, we would, uh, we are envisaging or we aspire to play a role in the uh, non-terrestrial quantum network, uh, which is the uh, drone-based kind of network. So what we are trying to do here is to mount an entangled source on the third party, a drone, and have two separate ground stations receiving the entangled source. And if I'm not wrong, um, the, the demonstration so far in India has been uh, one point to the other point. So you have uh, you have actually one of the parties, that the, either the transmitter is sitting with either of the receivers. So when you are actually taking the transmitter out in a separate location, it will give you certain challenges. So what uh, would that be? And uh, you know, there's some fantastic work done by researchers in China and they have claimed that this kind of a technology would be able to um, be more robust uh, in terms of different times of the day and different uh, weather conditions. Now, we are also very curious on understanding this, uh, this claim, and we would also want to see how can we uh, contribute in that direction. So with that, we move to the um, next slide. So here uh, we wanted to present you, you know, the the uh, the advantages and disadvantages on a very broad level uh, between the three technologies, which is uh, fiber-based, um, satellite-based, and drone-based quantum compute communication. So one is that the drone definitely gives you reconfigurability, flexibility, maneuverability over fiber and satellite, as uh, you have heard that you know. Fiber, fiber demands uh, of a dark fiber uh, or you have to uh, so in difficult terrains it may not be a possibility as well similarly satellite can be used for covering thousands of kilometers so um, to build a network in a small space or a land area network uh, uh, you know local area network a land network um, it, it may not be a very uh, fruitful idea so so uh, drone or any aerial based vehicle uh, communication will play a critical role there. Then on demand, you cannot have on demand ground stations. You cannot have on demand fiber networks. So this of course gives you some advantage. Uh, then we have a broader network coverage. Uh, yes, but then again, um, as you have heard that fiber to uh, fiber me, it is about uh, 100 to 150 kilometers. Uh, free space, uh, you know, direct free, uh, static free space uh, communication is also not very uh, long distance. It cannot cover very long distances. Then satellite covers um, thousands. So definitely drone and satellite. Drone can also become uh, play a role in van, but still this is uh, exploratory and no such demonstrations has been done, but claims have been made. Then again, the diverse weather conditions then uh, the drone can support emergency, strategic, and hazardous scenarios. So this can be play a critical role. Um, as uh, we just heard that, you know, the, the window time, uh, the operating window time for satellite is very less. Um, so for, for fiber, yes, you can go on um, for a long, for, for many days, for many months, for years. Uh, for drone, again, it, it is, uh, you know, you cannot hold the drone at one place for a very long time. It, it depends upon different factors, upon the load, the power consumption. Um, it, it has several, uh, you know, other factors to take, uh, to look upon. But yes, whenever you want it, you uh, take it up, you uh, distribute the keys and take it down. Mobility and agility and, uh, and of course, uh, the daunting uh, costs is not there. And then, uh, uh, and then less calibration uh, complexity. So then we go to the uh, next slide. 
So uh, we are looking at uh, uh, BBM92, it is an uh, entanglement based protocol. So what happens here is we have, uh, we have two bases, uh, rectilinear and diagonal. They are two separate bases of orthogonal polarizations. It is important because, uh, because the projections of each basis element into the conjugate basis are one by square root two, right? And uh, they are called mutually unbiased basis. So what Bob does is Bob will uh, randomly uh, choose in one of these uh, two bases to measure. Now, if we choose correctly, then his measurements will match with that of the Alice. And if he chooses incorrectly, then we know that, you know, 50% chance of measuring either element of the basis. And I think um, since you are attending the entire school, it is uh, uh, this slide may be, uh, may be easily understood by almost uh, all of you who are attending this. So we um, move to the next slide. I mean, yeah, I mean, we know that why we are doing QKD, you know, there are some fundamental bases of security, uh, no cloning theorem, the, the non-locality. Non so it again depends upon which kind of protocol you're using. You have a security uh, uh, laid out based on that kind of a protocol. There's a mapping done to understand the security model. So there is a lot of uh, scope of study and understanding, uh, even from the perspective of security of QKD, of any QKD protocol. Um, now we have uh, several uh, simulators. Um, CDAC itself has one of the simulator called QSIM, which is on cloud. And uh, it is one of the simulators which was developed and designed in a classroom by Professor Apurva Patel. And then, um, you know, that, that idea was taken from his classroom to nationwide via, uh, via development of several, you know, uh, middle layers and, and then, then the back layers and making different, uh, you know, uh, making that technology available across Pan-India. Now, the platform which we have used here is actually Qiskit. Um, so here we try to model the QKD uh, BBM92 and see its effect on, on a noisy and a noiseless scenario. So this is something which you can all play around, which is easily available. You can not only experiment with BBM92, but other protocols as well and see the effect it has when you're trying to simulate it in a noisy environment. Now, now this is uh, the, the, the pointers, you know, um, which define the QKD architecture. So when, when you have seen the, uh, the previous two speakers, they were talking from the engineering perspective of how these algorithms or how these protocols are actually realized on the hardware. And, and the challenges associated with it, because this really calls for state-of-art technologies. Now, any uh, so when we say QKD architecture, uh, it it um, the 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 first part is the the quantum key distribution protocol, which we say you know the, step one he will uh, generate single photon source. Now there are different ways of generating single photon source. Then it will be doing some kind of an encoding. Now you want to do the encoding in different uh, in in any of the or, uh, degree of freedom, be it polarization, be it orbital angular momentum, or uh, if you choose a differential phase shift QKD, then you're then you are encoding on the difference of phases of the consecutive pulses. Then you have a decoding part, and then you finally get your um, a binary sequence of data in zeros and ones um, at the uh, after the detector. So this entire thing is called quantum data transfer. Okay. What happens is at the end of this particular communication, you have a Rocky and then you have, uh, so these are the basics. So if you have a, a BB84, a basis measurement, entanglement basis kind of a protocol uh, or a BB84 also, there's a sifting. Sifting is the random, uh, when you are selecting random basis. So there you have a sifting factor of half. If you do DPS, you have a sifting factor of one because you do not, um, you do not uh, drop any element because of the difference of basis. So that gives, uh, gives you the sifted key and then you have error correction. So this is a classical error correction, like uh, maybe a cascade algorithm or a uh, LDPC algorithm. This has nothing to do with a quantum error correction. So once you do the classical error correction, there is a to and fro of data which is happening. So there will be an information leaked. So you have to quantify, understand the amount of information which has leaked, take it into account in the analysis part. When you're doing the analysis, then uh, you know you have heard that the, the different nature of single photon sources, whether it be single photon or coherent proton, a coherent state or it be entangled state, each will have its own leakages. So those 
has to be taken care of during the analysis. Then, uh, then you have the parameter estimation. Again, it depends upon the nature of protocol. So lot many uh, accountability is made in the section. And then you finally come out with a hashing factor. Then the, the error corrected key is hashed. And thereafter, you generate the secure key. Now, in between, during the error correction, since we know that any perturbation during the data transfer uh, can be mapped to the error correction, so error rate. So if it is more than the error, uh, say 10%, if it is a BB84, 11%, if it is a BB84, then you will drop the keys. So, uh, you know, in our standardization, there has been a limit given, given to 5%, 5% of error corrected key, which is, which is tremendous effort in terms of engineering. So, uh, and even if you have a lesser error corrected key, that gives you, a, you know, um, a more chances of a higher throughput in terms of secure key rate. So these are simple uh, steps, but if you go, uh, but there is an entire thesis or maybe more than one thesis for each and every step you see here. So uh, then we go to the um, uh, uh, air turbulence and attenuation. I will not spend again much time because, because it has been elaborately covered by, uh, by our uh, previous speaker. But just to sum it up that, uh, you know, the challenges uh, posed here is, uh, is um, turbulence. It's, the, it's, the, uh, it's a big uh, animal here because it impacts the protocol performance. Then um, the attenuation, you know, uh, it is very less compared to that of the fiber. Fiber has 0.2 dB per kilometer. And as in when you increase the distance, the attenuation increases and if you're doing a real system testing then the attenuation is more more than 0.2 it's a uh, you know in the, it's just in the um, in a, in, in a uh, i would say I, near ideal but in the system there will be splices done so it will be more than 0.2 db so a better candidate is actually uh, free space communication uh, so um, but then there are challenges associated with it then there are of course telescopes needed then well conditioned single photon sources uh, it has to give you, um, it has to be, it, it give you higher throughput, motorized tracking system, signal to noise ratio has to be uh, better in QKD. Then of course, understanding the unmanned aerial system itself. So there are several challenges. Now, um, again, this has been covered. So in the interest of time, let me just uh, skip it. Uh, you know, it, it just tells you about how the secure key is, uh, is shared between station A and station B. They both of them can be uh, several kilometers apart. And the same, interestingly, the same can be done using drone. So, um, so we can use drone to distribute secret keys to establish in a secure fashion between distant location and difficult terrains. As such, which is not possible with, uh, with a physical delivery or even with a satellite, because uh, we cannot build the ground stations uh, everywhere, right? Then um, this is one of the possibility as in when you study more, you'll come up with more use cases. Entanglement swapping is once a system where which would require the presence of a quantum memory. So you will share an entanglement, entangled state between uh, the drone and the station A. And then later you do a, uh, do a bell measurement here, which leads to entanglement swapping and establishing a quantum link between satellite station A and station B. So uh, this is another slide on reconfigurability. Suppose you have several drones. It's a network of quantum drones, and and maybe you are not using one of them, or maybe one of them is is uh, down. Then the other drone can go and take his place. So it offers you uh, reconfigurability in terms of network locations and node locations. Now, if you look at the previous works, uh, it has been uh, from drone to drone uh, uh, has been done using University of Illinois and Ohio State University. Um, this technology, so they have been working on this since 2017, but it was in 2020 and 2021, 2022, where um, this was actually demonstrated. So we, uh, so now this is one way of doing a drone-based QKD, and the second one is of course drone to ground, which has been done by Nanjing University. So uh, we are also actually we are actually uh, uh, working on this kind of a model where we have a drone to ground and then perhaps a drone to drone relay, and then in that way we can establish a network, non-terrestrial quantum network. So uh, at present, I have, uh, uh, you know, we are still working and, and I just said it's a few months uh, we have started and we have a, uh, we have a optics uh, room, clean room, which is we have built in CDAC Pune and uh, uh, very soon, I think by the end of this year, we, we may have something to show you as well. 
Then uh, apart from this, there are uh, uh, there are other activities uh, which CDAC is working on, which is the simulator, which I had just mentioned. Then we are also uh, working on the control uh, hardware for superconducting qubits. And uh, we have recently submitted a proposal for iron trap as well. So we are into development of control uh, hardware and measurement uh, hardware for, for different technologies of quantum uh, computing. We are also working on accelerators uh, for quantum simulators. So what happens when you are running a quantum simulator in your uh, CPU or you're working on accelerated compute devices? And we have a very interesting talk on that uh, by Dr. Manish Modani uh, on, on accelerated uh, compute device systems. So CDAC is working in this direction as well, and it is exploring different domains of, of compute hardware system, com uh, of compute uh, advanced compute systems. Now, apart from that, uh, you know, so so CDAC has twelve centers across uh, across India, and um, and many of them are interested in quantum uh, related activities. So this inf is information is for you, so that you, if you want to align up with such activities, you can you can um, you know you can talk, and you can also uh, write us some mails, and we can forward it to the uh, people who are working. So there are people working on quantum algorithms and use cases, um, particularly quantum machine learning applications. And, and um, another important area is the life sciences. We are also working on HPC QC integration. There is a lot of engineering challenges and implementation challenges associated with it. Then, of course, uh, capacity building is, is, uh, is a, will play a major role, but capacity building uh, is also is not only across uh, for the quantum information science, but also different uh, technologies associated with quantum uh, computing. Then uh, quantum communication, I uh, metro area quantum ex uh, metro access quantum area network. I think I have already uh, discussed this with you, and uh, this is something which we are drone based quantum communication we are working on. So yeah, so that brings me to the end of my presentation. Yeah. So if there is any question, I can take now. Hello, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, as we know that that noise, there is noise problem in uh, satellite-based quantum communications due to sunlight and attenuation in fiber-based quantum uh, quantum communication. So my question is that is there any option uh, which is independent of noise problem due to sunlight and attenuation? Can we manipulate the wavelength of our source that we? Uh, which is which is drawn to interact with sunlight, and we can get the secure communication. Hello. Yeah. So uh, there are uh, uh, you know so any anything which you are sharing via some medium will uh, will have attenuation, whether it be fiber, whether it be free space. If you're taking if you're picking different wavelengths. Um, but basically, uh, you may be able to come out with some sort of a solution that can that will have a minimal uh, or a lesser um, kind of an attenuation than the other. But the problem of, of attenuation or noise is is um, is so deep because these systems, uh, you know, are very fragile. Um, when you're talking about optical fiber communication, you are dealing actually with with milliwatts. But when you're talking about uh, quantum communication, something li like you know the fiber communication, you are dealing with picowatts. So at that level, you know the sensitivity sensitivity of your electronics, of your data storage, because you are storing enormous amount of information. How you are allocating the memory space, to, and then how you are processing the information. So it's not only the noise uh, in the uh, propagation. Okay. Uh, any medium, it will there will be some kind of a friction. There will be some kind of interferences that we cannot escape change of wavelength change of medium so you know we say if you want to go for fiber you go for 1550 if you go for if you go for um, free space go for um, you know 810 but now you see when when you're doing a qkd protocol even if you're going for 1550 that that is a better one to do uh, you know than an entanglement based which is polarization dependent which is again a wavelength of uh, you know 810 so so there are so many factors which comes into play. There is, uh, there may not be an easy one, one answer to it. Thank you, ma'am. I think we have one more question in the chat by Dr. Manjunath. The question is how many ground stations would be required in case of drone-based QCs? So, um, 
it depends upon the topology like you know uh, as you have seen the ohio one they have mounted everything on the drone so there is no ground station the entire quantum transmitter like a bb84 you know you have a prepare and measure the entire thing is on the drone the uh, but but uh, if you are doing an entanglement based system like the one in nanjing they have two ground stations now if you want to do an uplink or downlink if you want to have a network with uh, with a series of of uh, you know different topologies so it's a question like uh, how do you want to build it up uh, both the things are are possible you may or may not have a ground station did that answer your question dr manju uh, yes yes ma'am so why i ask this uh, because uh, uh, it can, the drones can travel only few distance right uh so it cannot cover like city to city because there is battery requirement uh the drones can uh, come down like this right so if you uh, have the drone base in one city and you have a drone base in other cities so there also you might need this system uh, made right like the ground stations made so there is multiple of these uh, ground station that is required so that that was my question yeah so again as you said that you know uh, you have one topology which is totally on the drones we have another topology which has both ground and fiber you have two topologies but they have to interconnect with each other so based on the requirement uh, on a base you know case to case basis it can it can but there is a you are certainly right the battery consumption is an issue how much is the weight how much compact you can make the the drone cannot stay more than you know several the whole day it, it will come down for some time so you can so those limitations will be there thank you uh, uh, yeah dr anandita other share it was yeah. a very nice presentation i just want to ask two thing one is the what is the maximum distance over this over with this case can be distributed with the uh, drone to ground if we say because it has to travel through atmosphere so what is the expected range that uh, we can ensure like there won't be any issue or you will have some significant amount of keys the keys are will be very less i don't think uh, so so because see you have seen that in 300 meters the the rate how it falls so uh, if you're talking about um, so drone is here uh, on the top and you have two ground stations the distance between the two ground stations uh, which has been demonstrated by by nanjing because they are the one who are working on drone and uh, ground stations it had been a uh, 100 meter and using an optical relay uh, quantum drone as a optical relay it was 200 but again uh, but, but again it it may, it is not the only limit you can stretch it but i i wonder if it can be done more than a kilometer because of different uh, as you said the atmospheric turbulences um you know and the and from the vertical height um i think it's about uh, 2 km it can go till, till maybe um 10 km but experimentally it has not been done we have to see those cases dr adarsh does, does that answer your question is it there dr adarsh did that uh, did that answer the question i got disconnected yeah. yeah okay and one more thing like uh, is there any regulations already there like how uh, how far can go with this drones and what is the maximum distance you can fly and there are no fly zones are already there so it kind of got regulations already there for this kind of drones or this needs to be developed um i no i i couldn't get the entire question you're asking about the regulation right I'm regulation asking. drone flying regulation i am just asking madam is there any kind of regulation like how, how like with respect to how, height how far you can go with the drones or there there are definitely no fly zones are there so is there kind of regulations which are already there or if we are thinking of that kind of drone thing then maybe government is going to regulate that kind of fly zone so that is what i just want to ask i have to find out i don't know <laughs> yes uh, drone regulation is there Thanks. there are a lot of regulations already available online so and uh, they change every year so you yeah. have to follow the latest uh, drone regulation thank you and usually you need to take permission from the air air like uh, atc right if you want to fly yes. every time you need to take the permission yes yes okay. yes so there there are uh, rules uh, associated with it but right now to we are in the experimental stage when we come there we'll see <laughs> 
but within the campus you can do right yeah 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 okay thank you uh, just one final question so what is the wavelength it use so we know in the free space one we use 850 to uh, nanometers uh, for ground based fiber based 1550 uh, so for the drone based uh, what is the wavelength uh, you use no we are looking at uh, uh, you know 810 nanometer okay okay So, are there any more questions? Yeah, can I ask a question? Yeah. Mm. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Could you please name uh, of noise mechanisms you face or consider in drone-based quantum communication? Sorry, uh, noise mechanism. Uh, as in, uh, we're talking about. Uh, the inherent uh, uh, noise which can happen because of the mounting or because yes, of type, the, type of noise mechanisms. It may be diffraction, maybe something beam else. Beam wandering, it will be beam wandering, it will be diffraction. Yes. Yeah. So could you name? Yeah. So as you yourself have named it, some these are the air turbulences, uh, beam wandering. So these are the uh, things which will come into play but now the uh, what we are looking at is you know if we can simulate some kind of a noise uh, in the in the lab to see how and where it uh, to be more precise so right now the the factors are huge uh, there are many of them so uh, which ones are going to play a critical role i think we are in the process of uh, uh, you know looking at it so maybe when once i uh, once we meet again in this conference i'll have something more to share with you but it's in a very nascent stage right now Thank you. So let us thank uh, Dr. Anindita Banerjee for this wonderful talk. Uh, so moving on to the next talk, we have uh, Dr. Raghavendra. So Dr. Raghavendra, are you around? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. So you can uh, share your sc uh, screen. In the meantime, uh, let me introduce uh, the participants to Dr. Raghavendra. He's a research scientist and head research at Kyokrishi. And uh, he did his uh, PhD in computational quantum chemistry from the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research. He was also research scientist, DST inspired fellow and published multiple papers in the field of quantum chemistry and computing. So over to you, Dr. Raghavendra, you may start. I thank you very much. I'd like to thank Dr. Anindita Ma'am for uh, giving me this opportunity to present uh, on the topic of Kandurabhadrishi. So I'll present to you about... Uh, could you speak more close to the microphone? Because it seems to me you are quite far from the microphone. Sure, okay. Uh, is it audible now? Audible it's, now? It's, yes, yes. Audible, audible. Thank you. Thank you. I'd I'll, I'll, uh, also like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity. So uh, I'll quickly brief about uh, the possible uh, the applications uh, of quantum computing that Krishi is interested in. So in terms of finance, uh, we are interested in uh, portfolio optimization, uh, risk assessment and uh, anomaly detection, credit scoring, and uh, uh, optimal arbitrage opportunities. And uh, in uh, from chemistry and material science point of view, we are interested in electronic structure calculation, strong correlation, and uh, design and development of novel materials for for applications like uh, catalysis sensors, photovoltaic cells, uh, electronics, etc., and also protein uh, folding and drug discovery. So I'll pre I'll initially present uh, some of our work based on uh, finance, uh, based, uh, mostly in optimal uh, portfolio optimization field. So I'll uh, quickly uh, share the challenges uh, that finance sector faces now, um, according to uh, the research articles that we follow. So. So this, uh, this financial crisis uh, in the past have uh, motivated the financial and banking institutions to focus uh, more to, uh, you know, on this risk coverage, leverage, uh, risk management, uh, and uh, supervision of liquid, liquidity, etc. So they are trying to spend more time and resources on this to avoid any possible uh, crisis in the future. And um, with this involves uh, calculation of a lot of statistical metrics, and uh, which are dynamical again, and uh, they so we need to keep uh, calculating these huge volume of metrics 
and this implies there's a lot of uh, uh, lot of complicated it's going to involve intensive computation and uh, so according to goldman sachs uh, big data driven approach uh, for uh, personalization and uh, customer personalization happens to be one of the uh, most important uh, uh, features in uh, banking and uh, it is uh, according to an article uh, it, uh, about 52 percentage of the customers want a personalized uh, uh, settings while only 25 27 percentage of them uh, feel that they get uh, such support uh, service and support which is uh, very not good looking for the banking sector so there's a scope for improvement again here which means uh, working on huge volume of data to personalize things and then so this so basically the current approaches to learn and optimize on big data requires a lot of computational resources and that's where quantum algorithms can uh, take up and uh, solve the problems that are limited within the classical setting and uh, due to increased digitalization as you all know uh, data security is a big concern and therefore uh, uh, avoiding any uh, cyber theft is very important to them and so basically we need uh, better risk management strategy strategies at uh, cheaper computational cost and better forecasting so quantum could be a one-stop solution for all that's the hope we have and uh, let's see so possible applications in finance, uh, I've listed out some of them here. So portfolio optimization, uh, basically selecting uh, uh, optimal portfolios uh, from the pool of portfolios so that uh, the, there is a maximum return over uh, minimum risk. And uh, anomaly detection is basically fraud detection, uh, identifying the false positives uh, in various transactions. It's a very big challenge uh, for uh, because it's very real time and highly dynamic. And credit scoring, as you all know, uh, this is a very important in uh, assessing the degree of risk associated while uh, lending money. And uh, uh, optimal arbitrage opportunity involves uh, identifying the optimal trajectory or opportunities, again, uh, within a set of uh, arbitrage, uh, pool of arbitrage that is available to us. And then there, there's a data security thing uh, where uh, people are working to use uh, post quantum cryptography to help solve the problems. So, in this talk or in this work, we are interested in uh, uh, portfolio optimization. I'll quickly uh, give an introduction about uh, portfolio optimization and the methodology and the research that we have got. So, the objective is to basically uh, maximize uh, the uh, return against a given risk. Uh, that's the objective of this portfolio optimization. It looks very simple, but it's very demanding uh, when there is a lot of constraints, which is natural in a real life setting. So this, this could be based on the investors uh, wishing only to buy and not sell immediately and uh, would like to invest in terms of uh, fixed or standard increments. And uh, there is a specific budget for a specific type of asset. And there's, of course, that uh, the correlation between different assets is always dynamically varying. So catch, to capture all these things uh, in, in the form of uh, constraints is a very daunting task and it involves a lot of uh, kind of computation. And uh, computation of several metrics, therefore, uh, coming from these kinds of uh, constraints, uh, using this huge volume of data generated, again, uh, is very computationally demanding. And uh, therefore, this uh, there's a scope, huge scope for quantum computer. Uh, to quantum algorithms to uh, help solve the problems in portfolio optimization. Uh, is my screen, I think I'm stuck here. Is my screen moving for you? Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, this uh, portfolio optimization is uh, basically dependent on uh, uh, Markowitz's mean variance principle, uh, which, uh, which is again uh, coming from the mean and variance of the data that is generated. And uh, so this is the objective function, which involves uh, binary uh, decision variable and mu is the expected uh, return on the asset, uh, correlation between uh, uh, sigma is the correlation between the assets and uh, between two assets. And Q is the coefficient for risk, and B is the budget available to us. Basically, solving, uh, optimizing this um, can get us the uh, identified optimal portfolios. And so we use variational quantum algorithms uh, to solve the problems. This is scheme for variational quantum algorithms, and I'll skip this 
uh, as most people know, of course, on the fundamental theories of quantum mechanics. So, in our experiments, we consider uh, three timelines. Uh, uh, so, 2016 to 2017, uh, we considered it to be a non-COVID session one and non-COVID session two, 2018 to 2019, to identify. Uh, and then COVID session, we have like uh, only one session on that. Thankfully, 2020 to 2021. So, the idea is to see uh, uh, using uh, the variational algorithms uh, if we are able to pick the stocks uh, that is available that is identified by the classical approach uh, classical markovitz approach is on par with the variational uh, algorithm so that is the idea and so we also selected uh, our uh, uh, stream of assets coming from different uh, uh, industries like retail commerce technology automotive oil and gas airways and hospitality so it might look obvious the results but the idea is to uh, see if we are able to do it uh, so this is the there are there's a because it, it involves like uh, so many companies and uh, across different uh, segments there the results are uh, so many just sharing one of the results just to emphasize a couple of points here so the idea is uh, we should get uh, the optimal portfolio that is on par with the classical one uh, NumPy again solver uh, result is the uh, this is the classic or classical one here, and uh, we used uh, IBM's Kiskit to do the calculation here. And as you can see, uh, the mark ones uh, in most cases uh, the results obtained using the QE or QAOE match with the NumPy again solver, showing that uh, the optimal portfolio that is obtained using the uh, classical value uh, is uh, same as the quantum one. So, and in some cases. It is not the case. So I'll quickly share the findings here. Um, so basically, the, uh, the results showed that uh, e-commerce companies like Amazon and technology companies like Google and IBM performed well during COVID times, which is uh, natural, uh, rather than oil and gas and uh, other uh, industries. So this is uh, the results obtained from the quantum uh, approaches like the QA and QA are similar, and they matched with the NumPy eigensolver results in these cases. And some of the optimal portfolios obtained through quantum approach did not match with that of the classical ones. So the the bit string that we obtained did not match exactly, showing there is a scope for improvement. We we are working on that. So the prob also the probability obtained for the ground state existence happens to be lesser than other eigenstates uh, in the calculations. So that's again another point of uh, uh, another point to work on. And it shows that there is a scope for improvement or tuning of answers for better accuracy that can be compared with that of classical approach. And then we also ran these jobs on uh, QPU, uh, of course, we faced with errors. And uh, we are working on uh, reducing the error uh, by reducing the circuit cost and all that. So this is uh, findings with the uh, portfolio optimization. I'd also I'd like to share another work, the other work we are interested in is electronic structure calculation. So uh, in, in this work, we take uh, geometries that are optimized and unoptimized, unoptimized from the classical uh, uh, quantum chemistry calculations. And we feed it in the, both the geometries with quantum computer. And then uh, we calculate the single point, which is basically single point uh, using uh, singles and doubles excitations, which is basically uh, uh, not unoptimized geometry, and then we also carry out the geometry optimization, and we compare the energies and the geometries obtained. So the results show that uh, the, uh, there is a strong uh, correlation. Basically, the correlation energy is defined as the difference between the full configuration interaction energy and the Hartree-Fock energy. And the classical results show uh, uh, full configuration interaction is more stable than the uh, uh, conventional artifact, which is natural, obvious, because uh, full configuration interaction is uh, uh, much better approximation than uh, artifact. So th this has been carried out for the two molecules, H2 and LIH, uh, using STO3G and STO6G basis sets. And uh, the result, the bond length obtained and the energies obtained using um, unoptimized geometry. Uh, and we can move to the, these are the, uh, convergence criteria. So now the point is, uh, if we give the unoptimized input and uh, carry out the single point calculation due to the unoptimized nature of the input and also uh, we are doing only single point, uh, 
the energy obtained using the quantum is much poorer than even uh, conventional hot reform. Okay, so then we uh, optimize the geometry using classical technique, and uh, the energy thus obtained uh, is closer to uh, the cla class uh, conventional uh, full configuration interaction. Okay, now comes the important thing: the geometry that we optimized using the quantum algorithm. Uh, was on par with exactly matching the uh, results that obtained using the uh, conventional full configuration interaction, showing that uh, the scheme that uh, we developed, the models that we integrated to uh, we do this calculation, uh, is working fine. So this shows that one, the now we have a scope for uh, this is to demonstrate that there is a scope for uh, doing. Uh, geometry optimization and obtaining the right uh, structure uh, using quantum algorithms that is on par with uh, conventional full configuration interactions. So, yeah, that's all uh, about uh, electronic structure calculations and finance. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Dr. Raghavendra. Uh, I would uh, request the participants to unmute themselves if they have any questions. Can I ask a question? Uh, thank you for your presentation. Yes, sir, please. Uh, could, you, could you please uh, name the algorithms, quantum algorithms, which you use or which you plan to use for solving some specific problems in, in your presentation? Here, we have used uh, variational quantum eigen solver and QAOA for finance. And uh, in the electronic structure calculation, uh, we've used uh, VQE. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any more questions? Uh, so if not, uh, we can thank Dr. Raghavindra for this wonderful talk and move on to our next speaker. Thank you. So, Mr. Just Minosha, are you uh, are you here? Ah, uh, yes, yes, I, I am here. Uh, thank you. Okay, so you may share. You may start share, sharing your screen. Ah, uh, yes. And in the meantime, I will introduce you. So, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Mr. Just Minosha. He serves as the co-founder and chief operating op uh, officer at Boson QSI, a company in the forefront of quantum powered engineering simulations. Uh, with a background spanning uh, computational finance and machine learning, uh, Mr. Minosha brings a unique blend of working with R&D teams and deep tech commercialization pro proficiency to the company. He has completed his master's uh, from university called College London with a specialization in ma machine learning and fintech. Beyond his role at Boson QSI, Mr. Minosha has applied his expertise to drive R&D projects across various financial institutions and startups demonstrating his ability to adapt and innovate in diverse sec diverse sec uh, sectors. So with this, I would ask Dr. Mino uh, Mr. Minocha to take over the session and please start his talk. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I hope I'm uh, able to, I hope you guys are able to see my screen and hear me as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can confirm. see your screen. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, thank you so much. Really, really excited to be here uh, in this uh, wonderful session today. Yeah, so yeah, let, let me give you a brief about what we do at Boson Kisai and walk you through uh, all the things that we are developing as well, uh, keeping time in mind. So yeah. So in a nutshell, we are developing an enterprise-based uh, engineering simulation software, which tries to solve the most complex simulation and optimization problem by leveraging advanced computing technology like quantum. So that's what we do in a, in a nutshell. So yeah. So when I say simulation, what do I mean? Uh, from a shampoo bottle to aircraft carrier to uh, Mars rover, anything and everything in between undergoes a very thorough, rigorous design and analysis process. And that's where simulation comes in. So there are a lot of simulations. There are engineering simulations, there are chemical simulations, molecular simulations, financial, financial simulations. And that's where my specialization is. In. But what Boson Kisai, we are only focusing on engineering-based simulations or multi-physics simulations. 
so you can think of a car like before a company like ford they're producing like a million cars in a year before they actually physically produces a car they have to virtually design it test it and do all kinds of analysis let me give an example like for example if they're producing an electric vehicle they have to do a simulation for the battery and hvac system and battery thermal management system so they would perform a thermal simulation in order to test the structural integrity of a chassis to do a crash analysis and to test the safety they would do a structural simulation or fluid simulation so all these simulation comes in handy for various uh you know various industries like automotive aerospace manufacturing health electronics energy and so on and so forth so end of the day these simulations are very computationally extensive and challenging because they are nothing but a mathematical set of very complex mathematical equations mostly partial differential equations there are like around seven governing pds uh, you have a diffusion equation you have a wave equation schrodinger equation so on and so forth neighbor stokes equation so on and so forth but the main challenge over here is uh, there are 70% of these equations can or simulations cannot even solve it because it's very rigorous and computationally extensive slide mein aa jayega that's the challenge sorry no i think we will request all speakers to please mute their mics there was some disturbance sorry yeah please go on Oh, no no worries. no worries thank you thank you yeah so the challenge here is basically as i mentioned simulations are nothing but very complex set of equations right and these equations it takes a lot of computational time to solve it and how industries try to bifurcate or manage this these aspects uh, in order to perform a high simulation it takes a lot of time right? which results in a very slow time to market for companies and organizations where we they have to be very competitive right another way to bifurcate this issue is you perform a low you go for a low accuracy or low fidelity one which doesn't take a lot of time but the take off here is or the trade away here is uh it's low accuracy right which results in uh, you know recalls and defects and for uh, like some of the not- notable examples over here is like boeing right we've all heard about boeing recalls and samsung note 7 recalls these results happen because they prefer a trade off with a low accuracy or low fidelity simulations and that's where we come in exactly right so what we are doing is we are developing quantum algorithms uh, to solve these high uh, highly complex highly uh, complex simulations uh, to give both the things high accuracy and low simulation time which ultimately results in a faster time to market low production cost for companies and ultimately no recalls so that's what we are offering in a nutshell for companies right and this is our product uh, how this is how it looks like uh, we have integrated our quantum algorithms are actually integrated with current generation of hvcs and the best part of this is uh, simulation any simulation engineer or ce engineer doesn't need to know about nuances of quantum right everything is happening in the back end and no no knowledge of quantum is actually required right and it's perfectly there's no change in the simulation experience for these engineers or any, any tech stack right so we have like five patents and we have access to virtually all the hardware is available today uh, we are part of aws microsoft ibm uh, and strange works yeah so the first version that we are offering is a uh, quantum inspired design optimization algorithm which is again called which can be integrated with uh, we are trying to integrate that with a finite element solver a third party finite element solver uh, such as like ansys or radios so compared to a traditional or state of the art uh, design optimization what we are what our uh, design optimization has the edge is like more optimal design and less number of iterations right that's the main thing and of course less computational time so the this is our roadmap this is how it looks like currently as of now we are focusing more on the design optimization part uh, optimization aspect in uh, the next era of co- co- focusing more on quantum inspired approach and then of course as the technology matures we want to move to hybrid and eventually of course the fault tolerant era and the the number of physics is also spread out accordingly you know, more focusing the first part on design optimization structural and the easy physics like thermal and all then uh, of course fluid takes a lot of time and it's very extensive as well so uh, of course the cycle is longer for that and here are some of the proof of concept and use cases we have done uh this is this one we did with maruti suzuki this is basically a control arm which is made of aluminum 
and the ultimate objective of this was to reduce the weight while keeping the readability high you can see that's the initial output and you can see that's the uh, optimized design uh, that we, have, we did for maruti suzuki and this resulted in around 7% weight reduction and performed with 1/8 of hpc cost so that's that's what we did and other potential use cases that we are are looking now uh, this is not something we performed but we are looking into is uh, of course optimizing crash uh, chassis crash worthiness which is of course coupled with design optimization and uh, the objective here is to keep uh, reduce material and while keeping robustness of structural integrity of a chassis right and these are some of the uh, things that we are keeping in mind uh, 10% more material reduction while keeping 1/10th of hpc resources and this is another use case that we are actually working on so we got a grant from ministry of heavy industries uh, to look in a use case for a uh, battery thermal management system or commonly known as thermal runaway problem uh, you might see you know especially during summer time in a kind of subtropical country like india uh, self emulating evs right uh, evs is catching fire because uh, the temperature is at that scale and this does not only happen in india but also like sub saharan africa region and even in the united states in arizona and so on and so forth and this is a very common problem a thermal runaway problem and we are trying to work it out with mhi as well so this is our timeline we just released our alpha version uh, in june and we are working towards beta and ultimately the flagship product uh, which will come in q1 of 24 and these are some of the achievements that you know we have been we are the only, only quantum company uh, in india that's part of ibm uh, quantum network and we uh, TCS and Techmindra they're supporting us and Intel with our channel sales partner and we have access to virtually all the quantum hardware systems and these are some of the areas that we were invited uh, as a keynote speaker uh, we have very strong connects with IETA we're working with plug and play and uh, yeah and these are this is my team uh, Abhishek and Ruth I'm joined with Abhishek and Ruth uh, both aerospace engineers uh, specializing in fluid dynamics but different area of fluid dynamics a route more on fluid structure interaction and abhishek more on uh, rotor craft application hpc rotor craft application and uh, wind turbine and this is a wonderful team highly experienced uh, team uh, members from different arenas from quantum from crash analysis from optimization from biz dev and even marketing and this is a wonderful advisory board uh, we are joined with dr chandan chaudhary who is currently dean of isb and he was md or former md of the sol systems and he's been uh, navigating us uh, on the intricacies of developing a multiphysics solver and of course mr city who's a uh, former head of uh, hero motor corp in cio department and and currently we are, we are present in three different continents india the united kingdom where i am from and then uh, us as well and we have over a team of 30 members so yeah thank you uh, thank you for this Uh, happy to answer any questions but again uh, uh, i'm not from technical uh, product side but happy to answer any questions <laughs> yeah so thank you very much for this nice talk mr minocha uh, we would request the participants again to um, unmute themselves and ask if there are any questions um i have one question uh, uh, th th thank you for your talk uh, my question is uh, when you talk about simulations so do you mean algorithms used by you in simulation based on modified classical algorithms inspired by quantum uh yes so we are actually developing our own uh, quantum algorithm and our own solvers from from scratch so uh, that that's what i'm by that okay so you are just introducing ideas of quantum algorithms into classical and getting those benefits which you have shared with us right yeah but yeah but you're yeah, developing yeah. Uh, from scratch uh, from from scratch. yeah yeah uh, is clear thank you thank you so uh, this is manish here from nvidia uh, good talk uh, ruth um I did PhD in the same area. I saw the PD and all, so I can relate what you are doing. Um, but would like to connect maybe offline or online because NVIDIA is doing the acceleration of the code, be it HPC or be it quantum, and we do the performance analysis and optimize on our GPUs, and certainly performance improves significantly there. 
uh, even the Boeing and all other example, what you mentioned everywhere we are there. And would like to connect more and understand technically more which algorithm you are using and what is the performance. Yeah, no, we'd love to. We'd love to connect more and uh, talk more about this thing and even show you like what uh, the things that we are doing, uh, like other use cases and other stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. would like to go deeper, little deeper and understand. Yeah, but good talk. Thank you. So are there any more questions? Uh, if not, um, we can thank again Mr. Minocha for this wonderful talk and let us move, move to our next speaker, Dr. Shesha Raghunathan. I see Dr. Raghunathan, you are there. You can, you can start sharing your slides. And let me introduce her. So Dr. Shesha Raghunathan uh, joined IBM in 2011 and he's now a senior research scientist in IBM Quantum. He got his PhD in electrical engineering uh, quantum computing from University of Southern California, Los Angeles in 2010. His research interest includes quantum computing, reconfigurable quantum computing and EDM. He's responsible for driving the development of strategic partnerships and in developing IBM's quantum business. Mr. Raghunathan does research in near-term quantum algorithms, circuit optimization, and quantum machine learning. He's an, he is an IBM quantum distinguished ambassador and is a lead for the EPAC region. With this, I request Dr. Raghunathan to start his talk. Dr. Raghunathan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I uh, thank the organizers for this opportunity. Uh, I'm gonna give a perspective uh, kind of a talk, uh, the point of view kind of a talk uh, here. Uh, it's going to be a little less technical, but hopefully it will cover the broader range of aspects of what is happening in the industry and beyond. Um, so first is, uh, I want to highlight the mission. Um, so there are two important missions for the quantum team in uh, IBM. Uh, one is to bring useful quantum computing, and the other is to make the world quantum safe. Um, so we all need to know the reason why we want to do any of these things, is to work on the planet for safe for our uh, for ourselves and uh, for future generations. There are many hard challenging problems, uh, many of which was highlighted in the earlier talks. Uh, if you look at it across the board, you will see right from agriculture to the industry, to the market, to deep down science, there are challenging problems. And each of these problems are very hard uh, to simulate or to do it classically. It has impact that is of global nature. Uh, so clearly there is a need for us to be able to do uh, much better compute and be able to solve some of these very hard problems uh, because it has big impact to the world around us. What is interesting now in the recent time uh, is that in practical terms, uh, we, are, we are seeing that the compute is getting branched in terms of the fundamental level. You are seeing quantum and classical coming about um, and this emergence is at least new uh, from computational standpoint since we have had compute uh, in practical sense in the last 60 to 70 years. Uh, that change is uh, very elemental. Uh, it goes from the very basic level of uh, encoding of the basic information, which was a bit in all this while uh, to a qubit or a quantum bit, uh, which is very fundamentally different uh, from what the bit is. What is the important aspect of it uh, is that you have um, the, the scaling of the state space that you have uh, growing exponentially. So for example, if you have a three qubit device uh, in classical, you would be in one of the two power three states. It will be one of the eight uh, options, but in quantum, you can potentially be in all the eight states. So that makes it fundamentally different. And what is relevant is that this grows exponentially. Um, it grows like two power n, where n is the number of qubits. And that makes this technology a uh, exponential technology. So just to put a reference to it, if you had um, 275 qubits that were clean, you are looking at a state space that is quite enormous. I mean, uh, beyond uh, the total number of atoms in observable units. So this is a ridiculously large number. The key though is how to uh, use this state space effectively uh, for some productive use, uh, points of problems that are relevant to us. So if you see why it is powerful, uh, this cartoon shows um, some basic aspect of why this is fundamentally different. What is the potential impact of that change in the fundamental model 
of information processing. So the one, uh, the oval in white are the problems that we can do efficiently today. Uh, the problem in light blue are problems we cannot adequately address because they are hard to do. Uh, what quantum opens is this dark blue oval, which sort of addresses some of the harder problems um, that are not available or that are not doable efficiently today. Now, the challenge, of course, is that um, uh, in practice, can we achieve that or not? And that becomes a slightly different aspect of this problem. Now, what are the applications? There are many, many use cases that are being looked at. Uh, earlier, uh, uh, previous talks uh, covered some aspects of these use cases. You heard portfolio optimization, you heard simulation problems, uh, you had uh, uh, many other derivative pricing in financial markets. You could be risk uh, assessment, fraud detection. There are many other problems here. But broadly though, there are three broad categories of areas where um, there is potential for quantum uh, value. Uh, to come about. One is the simulation of uh, quantum systems. Um, this is the uh, traditional setup of quantum computing uh, from the Feynman uh, argument. Uh, but beyond that, there are two other areas. One is the artificial intelligence. Uh, you saw some of the use cases um, uh, that have ML flavor or quantum ML flavor. And then you have this Monte Carlo and optimization type problems as well. So in Monte Carlo, for example, there is potential for polynomial uh, st speed up. Basically in quantum uh, sense, it converges sooner than the classical Monte Carlo. So there is some uh, usefulness to be explored. Uh, how much of it is practical or not remains to be seen, but there is certain uh, results that are there uh, for polynomial scale up. So you will see that there is whole range of application and potential use cases that are coming about. Um, at IBM though, uh, we are engaging with industry and there is a significant uptick in interest in the industry to explore this technology. Um, and what you see in the brackets are some of the new partners who have joined us in exploring. We have looked at something in the order of 40 or 45 use cases across various industries, uh, across various of uh, these partners. For example, Bosch recently, they are interested in material science. Credit mutual, you can very well imagine it is mostly gonna be in the financial sector. First, uh, I think they are looking at uh, um, fraud detection and some of the other aspects of it, uh, and so would some of the other finance sectors or fintech sectors. Uh, these problems would be of interest to them. So, but again, you will see that it comes from these broad categories, different industries based on the use cases, based on the problem at hand, will be looking at different ways of applying. Uh, so you will see that some of them will be using simulation problems because there is a quantum problem that they are dealing with uh, from a simulation standpoint. Uh, then you would want the simulating part to happen. Uh, significant majority of them do use um, the middle one, which is related to ML, uh, because these days there is a lot of ML deployed anywhere, and there are many challenging prediction and classification type problems. So naturally uh, that shows up in most of the many use cases. And some subset of them uh, look at optimization and as well as Monte Carlo. So where are we and how is it, what is happening right now? If you look at performance, uh, the way we see it, uh, we look at it from three metrics, the number of uh, qubits, that is the scale, the quality of those qubits, uh, which is circuit fidelity, and then the speed of execution. This is the operational deployment execution time. So these three metrics together we feel uh, sort of captures the performance of uh, a quantum system. So here is the uh, 433 qubit Osprey, which is now currently deployed and available on cloud. Um, so you see that this is the first time we, uh, probably in the Eagle processor we had it, but we had multiple layers uh, of uh, uh, and, uh, circuit connections. You had the uh, topology, the circuit topology, uh, so you have now multiple layers, much like how we have in our classical processors. You have multiple layers of wires, and then that gives flexibility in placing the different qubits at different points and connectivity, et cetera. So uh, it's getting more and more sophisticated and more, more and more advanced. In terms of the other two metrics, you see that there are two uh, important ones, the quality and the speed part. On the left is the quality measured as shown in quantum volume. Um, the y-axis is in log scale, so a linear uh, thing here uh, would mean it's exponential. And this particular metric, I believe, is very important, and that's one of the reasons why there is a lot more interest. And this is going quite rapidly. Uh, so there's been a consistent improvement, and in fact, it's growing much faster 
uh, than the diagonal that you would see, which means that it's growing, the exponential rate is faster. Um, so what, what is interesting is that in the next year or two, uh, when we get into the regime of 10 power three plus or 10 power four in quantum volume, we are gonna get into very interesting space. And the latter part of this talk, I'll touch on one aspect of it, um, why we think this is uh, relevant and important. But this improvement in quality, while the qubit is increasing, is what is making the space very interesting. Uh, in, in, in so far as uh, quantum computing uh, implementation in practicality goes, we do think that in the next couple of years or so, it's gonna get very interesting uh, when, when we hit certain regimes and we get into certain quantum volumes and the capacity of the hardware to execute deeper circuits. Uh, the CLOP circuit layer operations per second on the right, uh, this is uh, uh, because quantum is, uh, uh, the because quantum is fundamentally probabilistic, you will have to do multiple runs of it and sample it to get the distribution. Uh, typically, you, a circuit needs to be executed multiple times and different experiments need to be done across it based on the uh, various algorithms, particularly the hybrid uh, quantum classical algorithm that we currently have going requires multiple executions of these circuits. So the limiting part is how efficiently I can run these circuits end to end quickly. Uh, the total number of executions that we have to do. And that is measured by the circuit layer operations per second. And this is very important from practicality standpoint. Um, so if you have to compute certain amount of uh, things, say for example, I have one day of time and I wanna be able to calculate something of significance, I need to be able to execute as many circuits as possible per second in order for me to increase my capacity of how much of uh, complex circuitry that you, I could do, calculations that I could do, and therefore have some useful result uh, come about, thus leading to a potential quantum advantage. So this metric becomes very important from practical standpoint. Many of you here, certainly uh, this audience would be privy that uh, um, the quantum computing field has had a big flip when IBM started uh, putting its machine on cloud uh, in May, 2016. Since then, you could see that nearly half a million people have registered. Um, there are two, they are averaging nearly two trillion runs a day. Um, uh, sorry, two trillion runs overall and four billion runs uh, on a typical day. Uh, currently, we have over 25 uh, systems on cloud. And what is uh, gratifying is that significant amount of research is happening uh, on these devices and platform. Uh, if you see this particular plot on the left, uh, you can see that the number of research work uh, being run on quantum and Qiskit, and more relevantly, a lot of uh, runs that have been run on actual hardware, the cutting edge, uh, the latest hardware, um, the amount of research is happening is increasing quite rapidly, as you can see. Uh, what is important also to note is that access to these hardware becomes very important for cutting edge research uh, in these days. If you go to any major physics conference these days, uh, things uh, related to practical quantum computing uh, in invariably involves access to the latest technology and that latest technology is uh, running things in hardware. And that's where there is a lot of opportunity to do uh, research and potentially some interesting ideas, IPs, and also opportunity for potential startups to emerge. Um, here, what you are seeing on the, uh, on the top are the various generations of processors we are currently on the Osprey, um, uh, I'll be talking about the roadmap shortly, but on the bottom left, you see the usage pattern. Uh, the blue uh, color indicates running in hardware. Uh, the red or uh, slightest pinkish uh, red that you see on the plot means that it's a simulator run. Um, what seems distinct is that um, Europe, uh, Japan, and the US, they seem to be running a lot more on hardware. India, while is quite active, in uh, quantum, which you very, very well can see. However, I see a lot more of red, which means that there is more, a lot more simulator runs rather than running in hardware. Uh, I, I think there is a need to uh, democratize access to hardware and running in hardware brings you much closer to the cutting edge of the research. On the bottom right uh, is the developer certification. This clearly indicates uh, India's strength in this case. You can see that uh, the number of uh, developer certificates uh, India and uh, US are head to head and way ahead of the rest. And that seems like uh, correlates with the amount of interest on the actual runs being made on the left. Uh, we already have the software skills. Uh, we could potentially be a leader uh, in this sector given the amount of interest. Um, if, if we address the access to the hardware part, 
um, in a reasonable fashion, then we could also get into the real cutting edge research aspect as well. Um, in terms of uh, engaging with uh, uh, various aspects, there are two kinds of things we do. Uh, one is there are various computational centers. These computational centers means we have physical machine deployed. Um, you could see that um, uh, originally the original machines were in Yorktown in IBM research and then PKFC data center, which is again IBM data center. But besides that, we have deployed physical machines um, in Canada, in Germany, in Korea, in Japan and many more are in the pipeline. But what is important is we have over 60 plus uh, systems that we have deployed since 2016. On Quantum Hub Innovation Center, last year, September, IIT, IIT Madras joined us as one of the Quantum Hubs, our Quantum Innovation Centers. There are 34 of them worldwide. Um, and the idea is that these innovation centers becomes the key elemental part to do research, development, engaging with industry and so forth. Uh, so this is very vital and important in uh, getting the quantum industry up and running. And to that end, uh, and also the members beyond the hubs, there are many direct one-on-one -on -one partners and uh, members. Uh, and what is important also is that there have been nearly four plus million learners of uh, the various uh, education materials that we've been putting out uh, through these years. Um, so from in terms of building the industry, uh, advancing quantum uh, is one of our four uh, aspects. So uh, we do develop the technology. Uh, we do have open source, open size. We do believe in that. You could see that Qiskit uh, is an open source, open ground uh, platform. A lot of our latest uh, innovations and technologies go there. Um, the innovation centers that you saw on the previous chart have very important uh, aspect to do. They do um, you know, uh, uh, research and development for sure. Uh, education naturally falls under it, uh, workforce development, but also economic development in terms of potential startups uh, and also provide services uh, as needed uh, to the wider economy. Industry adoption is where the direct client interactions, the scaling of these uh, solutions with partner engagements, et cetera. So we do work in those aspects so that other industries develop, uh, use cases are looked at, and there could be potential uh, deployment opportunities as uh, time goes on. Then the application services, um, uh, access to the resellers part, software providers and application integration. And finally, recently the quantum safe, we did put out a quantum safe roadmap as well. Quantum safe is just as important. Uh, as I mentioned, it's one of our mission statements. We wanna be make sure that world is quantum safe as well. So all in all, uh, all these aspects need to be done in order to build a quantum industry. So development roadmap, what is coming ahead? Um, so if you see um, Osprey is online, it's available. Uh, this year we're gonna have, uh, latter part of the year, we're gonna have 1000 plus qubits. Um, Condor coming and also Heron, uh, that's gonna be this year. Uh, there are different canonical experiments that are being done with each of these uh, um, different uh, QPO architectures. Uh, the figure sort of gives you those indications. Some of them have classical communication, some of them are quantum communications. Next year, we'll be having um, you know, Flamingo, which will have quantum communications. And then uh, year for the 2025, we are looking at 4,000 plus qubits. Uh, the layer above, the three layers above of the software layers. Um, these are three different layers. And I want to highlight one of them, which is the error separation and mitigation. Uh, this is very important and vital, and uh, this uh, is uh, relevant because we do think that um, through this approach, um, we can unlock some of the quantum value. Um, so that's uh, gonna unlock some of these important key capabilities that we think um, will help the industry look at potential useful quantum computer come about. But beyond that, if you look at the algorithmic layer, the orchestration part, um, this quantum serverless uh, for uh, anything that you would want to do at a large scale in cloud, you do need orchestration platforms. Orchestration would mean that you do need to know how to balance the load. And that's where the circuit knitting libraries and toolboxes would come into play. And on top of which you will have various application layers and three broader categories that I highlighted before, machine learning or AI, natural science or simulation problems, and then the optimization motor carload. These are the three broad uh, layers of application platform that you're gonna see. So what is important here is that as time progressed, you can see that these software stack is getting highly matured and highly specialized. 
And this is leading to very interesting space that the industry is now evolving uh, much and more, uh, more rapidly in a more uh, structured manner. And I think as time progresses, uh, you will have different skill sets or different layers, which would be very deep, that would be needed. So uh, one quick comment on error mitigation. There are various kinds of error suppression and error mitigation techniques. This is a very active area of research now. Um, this is um, very important because uh, in order for us to look at the noisy near-term devices that we currently have, uh, in order for us to be able to get the maximum out of those devices uh, and to unlock potential value, uh, I think these techniques will play a vital role. And as you can see with the publications, there are many of those uh, things that have been actively uh, looked at. I'll circle back to that particular part of error mitigation in a bit, but before that, uh, what is ahead is that next year, we're gonna have this 100 by 100 challenge. So what IBM is saying here is that we're gonna have a 100 qubit with 100 depth that will be made available um, next year sometime. Starting middle or uh, beginning of the year, but through the year, we'll probably have few revisions, but nonetheless, you're gonna have uh, capacity uh, that is, I feel, is quite reasonable uh, and complex. So what is meant by uh, 100 qubits and what is 100 depth is the number of uh, entangling gate, multi-qubit gate, uh, in this case, the C0 gates that you will have, uh, that will be the 100, that depth will be 100. Uh, we don't count the single qubit operations, but only the two qubit operations here. And that will be up to 100. And what we are saying is that uh, you could potentially uh, run um, uh, the expectation value calculations of, of uh, operators in a noise-free manner uh, for a circuit which is uh, 100 qubit wide and circuit depth of 100. I think this um, is a very interesting regime that we are entering. However, in order for this to be useful, I think um, uh, we do need to be in the error rate of 10 power minus three or so. So the way that goes is that um, on the y-axis, think of it as time. Um, um, and uh, what you are plotting is uh, how much of uh, time would it take uh, for a depth 100. Um, so what we need is for practical useful compute to happen, the horizontal line that you see is the equivalent of one day. Uh, currently our error rate is somewhere in between 10 power minus two and 10 power minus three. Um, uh, we are reasonably confident that we should get to this 10 power minus three regime uh, through this year. And by next year, we should have this available and therefore uh, we should be able to have this 100 by 100 challenge. So what that means is that we are in interesting times in compute within the quantum context. Um, we think that uh, to unlock quantum value, that is a quantum hardware, uh, which could give, solve certain problems of interest at scale and add value to solution could come from error mitigation. And that would be a continuous path towards error, error correction. Uh, we don't necessarily have to wait till error correction is available in order for us to be able to unlock quantum value. So in this cartoon that you're seeing is that we are currently um, in terms of uh, um, the, uh, complexity, we are probably a little behind the classical at this point in time. And we want to be able to cross this barrier and get to this point where uh, some interesting things could be unlocked. And what uh, 100 by 100 uh, is doing is, um, we think the hardware capacity would be at reasonable level, whether there is a solution that would come about remains to be seen. So the effort is always to push the boundary and get us to a point where we, we are beyond this regime and we are, at least if you solve certain problems of interest at scale and demonstrably so to show that uh, it does solve a problem, uh, either um, you know the cost of doing it or the quality of the results um, that, that is beyond what is doable uh, classically, uh, that will get it uh, very interesting. And that's what we call as useful computation. And this has to happen within practical time. And that's where the time comes in. And that's where the word useful is also there in our mission statement. So all the work and effort that is going on with the 100 by 100 and going forward is trying to push this into this regime. And if we do achieve that and some result comes about, then we potentially are unlocking quantum value uh, as we work our way towards quantum error correction regime. So again, uh, the same picture, uh, the path um, to quantum advantage uh, is gonna, we think is gonna be uh, continuous and error mitigation will be an important pillar in helping us navigate that. 
uh, towards uh, what will be eventually a fault tolerant computation. Um, so in the long run though, we are looking at quantum centric supercomputing. Uh, so where the envision, uh, the user could kick off a program, uh, submit the job, uh, that would be the first part. When the job gets kicked in, it's obviously gonna hit a server in the cloud. The cloud server uh, then talks to an intelligent orchestration framework. Um, and that then, uh, then navigates, uh, uh, deploys the particular job across multiple uh, uh, deployments. Once that is done, uh, the particular uh, server then gets, uh, uh, compiling is done, parameterized is done, and then you decompose many circuits. And in this example that you will see, it uh, for it decomposes into four uh, as an example. So it takes a parameterized uh, circuit and then de uh, decomposes into four. That then goes to a quantum data center and those four parallel runs get run in the quantum hardware. The results get generated, uh, come to the, um, the results are then need to be organized. So there needs to be some stitching that needs to happen. Uh, and once uh, you have to, pull all of them together and reconstruct the results. And then the user gets the answer. Now that's the eventual goal, um, but there are already a pathway to that. Uh, if you have noticed the news a uh, week or two back, um, uh, there was an announcement um, uh, that we will have a 100,000 100, qubit uh, quantum centric supercomputer uh, by 2033. It's a 10-year plan. Uh, with IBM is investing with University of Chicago and University of Tokyo jointly helping some sort, sort of problems uh, to get to this quantum centric, centric supercomputer uh, with 100,000 qubits uh, involved. Finally, I'll make a comment in the Indian context. Uh, this report, Morgan Stanley had done a report uh, last year. Uh, this is an economic uh, oriented report, nothing to do with quantum per se. Uh, but what is important are some of the key takeaways from this report. Uh, you see that uh, the, the expectation or the prediction is that the economy is going to nearly triple, uh, not exactly triple, but there or thereabouts. But if you see the growth sectors, the, uh, the report calls, uh, calls out manufacturing as factory for the world, services as the office for the world, and so forth. You see that the growth sectors are manufacturing, the services are going to grow, financial sector is likely to grow. Uh, renewable energy is an important piece, as well as the demand for energy is going to grow. A uh, significant portion of this underlying element is technology is at the core of this development. And um, many of these are uh, fairly advanced technologies, uh, capabilities would be needed, and I think quantum would play a role. Uh, talking about uh, the services sector, given that it's um, it's so huge in India and also uh, it's expected to grow quite rapidly uh, through this decade, at least according to this report. Um, here, what you what I have is uh, Ernst & Young UK uh, did a quantum readiness survey, and this survey was to the CXOs of um, uh, over uh, the sample size is over 500 plus of CXOs of across various industries. Uh, and ask them about quantum readiness. On the left, uh, the question was, when did they expect sufficient uh, maturity, um, the quantum uh, to reach sufficient maturity to play a significant role on the right is what are the steps that they gonna take to prepare for that? So if you look at the left plot, uh, various uh, uh, horizontal bar graphs are different times. This survey was done in 2022. Um, if I look at the bottom two bars of 2031 plus and uh, after 2035 that, and if I remove those two, I'm looking at roughly 82% uh, of the CXOs um, in UK. Um, though I, um, while this is UK, I, I do want to say that this is likely to be very representative of OECD countries. Uh, the CXOs, uh, nearly 80 plus percentage of CXOs believe that quantum is gonna be playing a major role this decade. And if I look at it um, 2022 to 2025, uh, I'm looking at nearly 50% believe it's gonna happen in the next two to three years. Um, on the right, uh, the three uh, bar graphs that you have are different uh, steps to take. Um, if you look at the coloring, uh, the darkest on the right is the likely after long-term or five years. Basically they are saying that uh, we'll look at it only after five years. You see those percentages are very, very minimal. And if you add up, um, uh, look at uh, one to two years or less, you will see that over 60% plus, uh, they are looking to take action on doing something on quantum. 
uh, in the next two to three years at the, uh, at the very least. And they expect that uh, they, each of these companies need to be ready and uh, be prepared for quantum in this coming time. Uh, with that context, with that economic context, uh, what it means to India, I'd like to end my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sesha Raghunathan, for this activity and very colorful talk. So, means uh, the participants can unmute themselves now and ask the questions. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello. Go ahead, please. Uh, sir, often we talk about simulation. So, for simulation, what we do inside the quantum computer at very low temperature with atoms. So, we can simulate the atoms with the help of atoms. Is it okay to say that simulate the atom with the help of atom inside the quantum computer? Yeah, I mean, um, you're simulating another quantum system using a, a different quantum system. So, like in uh, classical, uh, you are using your Boolean logic or transistor to simulate everything in the world that we currently do. Much like that, uh, a quantum system uh, representing the qubit, it could be different realizations. Uh, in our case, uh, it is a superconducting qubit. There could be spins, there could be different realizations of it, but I would call it a quantum system, uh, simulating a different quantum system. It need not be atom per se. It could be an electron. It could be an artificial atom like in superconducting qubit. Um, it not, need not be really an atom as such. Okay, so thank you, sir. And there is uh, another question uh, from the chat from Dr. Colin Benjamin. His question is, what is quantum volume for IBM Osprey? So I think we either have put it or we in the process of putting it. Uh, so let's see, the first versions, yeah, we have not put it yet. So you can keep an eye on this. Whenever we have it ready, we're gonna put it. So this is more recent version. So it typically goes through a few revisions. R1 is the first revision. Uh, at some point, we're gonna post it here. So you can go look at quantum-computing.ibm.com as and when we are ready, uh, we'll start putting those things. So typically exploratory means there is still certain tuning and other things that are being done. Uh, so as and when it, there is data available, we're gonna put it here in uh, quantum-computing.ibm.com. Okay, so are there any more questions? Uh, yeah, I had a question. Yeah, please go. Um, the, from the graphs you showed, you, it clearly showed basically that India has a huge interest in IBM's quantum computer. Um, why hasn't IBM opened one of its data center in India yet? I think it it's a business call to have it's, uh, it's a IBM business quantum call. computer in India. It's it's like anything else. It's a business call, right? Um, um, so uh, all these data center, other things that we have deployed, uh, they all cost money, and somebody has to pay for it. So uh, it's a business call that needs to uh, that needs to happen there. Thank you. Yeah, so any more questions? Can I ask a question? Yeah, 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 please. Uh, actually, I am an MSc physics student. So I wanted to know what are the opportunities for young researchers who want to do quantum computing? Uh, in, in IBM, in India, uh, in what context are you asking? Yeah, in India. In IBM. In, so um, IBM, uh, there are different uh, ways. Of course, um, whenever uh, there is a job opportunity um, uh, in quantum, in fact, recently in my LinkedIn, I posted one opportunity. Um, so you would want to take a look at that. Uh, so that there are possible full-time positions that could open up. Uh, we do hire interns uh, from time to time, typically in summer. Uh, there are other ways of engagement like GRMs, the remote mentoring, that's not a paid uh, engagement, but you could still get engaged. Um, so there are various um, modus operandi of getting engaged um, uh, with us uh, on various aspects. Uh, so full-time internship uh, or mentoring. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so there is another question in the chat. Uh... 
it's from jay kumar mr jay kumar is asking is it possible for individual researchers to join ibm quantum network no ibm quantum network uh, typically uh, it's not individual researcher the network is typically an institution uh, it could be a private company or an academic institution or a research institution say like cdac on other so it's these are not uh, pure academia these are not uh, these are research labs so typically it is institutional um, and we don't i don't think we can do any individual research level engagement like that uh, i have a question mm -hmm. uh, is ibm quantum uh, available in dubai or uh, uae Yes, the cloud-based access should be available there. Uh, yeah, uh, apart from cloud-based, is there anything like uh, where we can have some job opportunities or anything else? So, the you don't necessarily need physical machine for job opportunity. Um, yeah, I hope you distinguish the two. If you are solving certain problems, um, you could have companies that are looking at those problems. Uh, it could be a software solution that you are doing. Uh, you could solve certain problems using cloud, and it could be deployed in cloud. Uh, and if there is a physical machine in some place, they could run it on a physical machine. So as such, physical machine being there is not a necessary condition. Um, the job opportunity depends on whether there is a, a company or institution working in quantum computing, uh, looking to solve certain problems. Uh, that's what determines uh, opportunity, not so much physical presence of machine in that particular company, uh, particular uh, uh, geography. Okay, thank you. So let us once again thank Dr. Sesha Raghunathan for this wonderful session. And thank you again for the chance. Thanks yeah. very much. Thank you, Sesha. Very nice talk. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. So moving on to our next speaker, we have Dr. Anilban Mukherjee. Uh, Dr. Anilban, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. So you can uh, show yourself uh, or start your or start sharing your slides. Sure. So is my slides visible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is visible. In the meantime, uh, let me introduce Dr. Aninbar Mukherjee. He did his PhD in strongly correlated systems here at ISER Kolkata, where he developed the unitary renormalization group technique for studying systems relevant to material sciences. In his one year postdoctoral stint at MS National Laboratory USA, he worked on adaptive quantum algorithms for simulating rare earth materials, which got featured in physics today. At TCS Quantum Computing Incubation, Dr. Aninban has developed the cubitized downfolding technique that greatly reduces quantum resources needed for computing the exchange correlation potential from first principles, which is relevant for various post DFT calculations. So, with this, I request Dr. Aninban to start his talk. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Really glad to meet everyone. Uh, so basically, I'll just start by introducing like the research in quantum at TCS. Uh, TCS research uh, in quantum started uh, almost five years back and almost one and a half years ago, uh, we started uh, incubating quantum technology. So roughly right now we have um, 20, paper, 20 plus papers in this field and six patents we have filed. And we have a team with expertise in quantum machine learning, quantum optimization, quantum chemistry, and also QKD, or, or that is quantum security areas as well. And it includes, it includes a team of 50 specialists, quantum specialists, as well as seven PhDs. And we are directly talking to a lot of customers and in the pharma sector, in the transportation sector, in the oil industries, and yeah, so we have, we have, and we are all working with all the major partners like AWS, IBM, Microsoft, uh, Zapata, INQ, OSANQ also. So, and and uh, what we are looking for is basically channelizing quantum services and solutions, uh, which can be deployed in near or medium term on quantum hardware. So with that, I'll just uh, go into one specific topic which, which I am working on, I'm leading that part is basically, yeah. So before that, this is a team that is there for the incubation. I'm working on the chemistry front. Uh, Vidyut is our head. Shantan, Shaurav, 
Shomo. They're working on optimization and quantum security areas. And Godfrey, he's our technical consultant. And Sridhar Hai heads the lances. So with that, I'll just start with the, uh, the aspect that uh, I'm looking into. Like one of the aspects that I'm looking into is in the context of pharma, is in studying drug protein systems uh, in the background of a solvent environment which is something that uh, is a very uh, is the very heart of doing tr drug assessment drug discovery uh, uh, let's say we have got drug molecules after that you need to do toxicology and a lot of uh, r and d stuff in order to assess the applicability of a drug for a given disease so that's the practical problem and that requires uh, some uh, quantities to be computed mm -hmm. like drug scores or energy free energies, which at the heart of it involves a primary bottleneck, which is solving the Coulomb Hamiltonian. So basically all of these calculations could have really sped up if we could have handled the Coulomb Hamiltonian better. But the catch is that this Coulomb Hamiltonian is an is a is a very difficult problem to handle at, uh, because it has uh, uh, many body correlations into it. It has kin kinematics and then they have a strong interplay. And uh, unlike unlike problems in condensed matter uh, where you have a notion of lattice, when you go for quantum chemistry problems, you uh, lose that notion and you do not have a very fine, uh, fine uh, simple way of writing down the structure of the, the Hamiltonian. The scaling of the number of terms in a Hamiltonian is n to the power four if n is the number of orbitals. So, so that basically makes the Hamiltonian very complicated to handle. And uh, what uh, currently one would have uh, wanted is to obtain the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian. If one obtains that, then from there computing free energies or the enthalpy or the, uh, or the chemical potential, those would have been far far easier because we would have got handled the partition function or the free energies and then we could have done all the uh, calculations from first principles <laughs> hello hello uh, is there any question sorry uh, okay i i think just yeah so but now let me talk about some of the costs uh, in doing this. Like uh, DFT, which is the which is uh, one of the most uh, important techniques in industry to get a handle on uh, putting in quantum effects onto their problems, has a has a has a uh, cubic scaling. Uh, with AI, with uh, with machine learning, somehow sometimes the scaling can be made order n, but otherwise it's an order n cube scaling. On the other hand, you do not achieve chemical accuracy with this, which is somewhat something that you need in order to zero in that. Let's say I have two drug molecules and I have one ligand target, and I want to assess which drug works better. That requires us in computing energies that are not absolute energies, but rather energy differences. And most of the times, these energy differences uh, need to be below one kilocalorie per mole. On the other hand, the errors that is incurred with the DFT is much more than that. So that's basically what it means is that DFT gives you a very good prediction of the structure, but not necessarily that great prediction of the energetics. But then there are post DFT techniques, uh, starting from something with reasonable cost to something with very high cost, but also high accuracy, like couple cluster or the configuration interaction method and that is where the entire problem is that we have a huge set of classical com computational chemistry methods available to us but th those have very steep scaling with, res with respect to the problem size that we're trying to solve and uh, on the other hand we have a, a variety of techniques in quantum also that have come up like the variational quantum algorithms or the qubitized phase estimation technique and starting from the variational quantum algorithms what we understood is that it has it doesn't have great scaling at least uh, i mean uh, variational quantum algorithms uh, do not have great scaling in terms of the depth and it's uh, that's why for most of the practical applications of quantum chemistry one believes that the qubitized phase estimation can have a better chance but then again, uh, it's something that uh, is uh, applicable with a much larger number of qubits. So uh, there are means to reduce that as well, like using first, first quantization approaches. But uh, nevertheless, if the number of electrons are higher, then again, the scaling still remains large. So what we are looking into is 
let's uh, let's say we are looking to different practical practical applicability areas like drug protein scoring when you need to compute binding free energy or drug molecule design when you need free energy or the crystal structure prediction or need the enthalpy all of this does not require only assessing the ground state but also the excited states so we're not talking of a single isolated molecule in a vacuum we're talking of a molecule of, of a large molecule or maybe a set of molecules in an environment and at a different temperature uh, or pressure or ph and those quantities basically uh, uh, mean that you need to compute the energy scales, not only the ground state, but also the higher excited states. And you have to study their interplay at different temperatures and environmental conditions. So that is where the problem becomes really complex. So what we have recently come up with is this technique of qubitized downfolding, where the idea is that we downfold our vitals systematically and in the process of doing so, we capture more and more information of the energy spectrum. And this we uh, do with with a scale with a qubits which scale logarithmically with system size. So basically, with we have a, a beyond a certain n, we can show that we have a sublinear scaling of the number of qubits. On the other hand, the number of gates we show that there is a polynomial. Uh, gain in terms of the number of gates being used compared to other techniques. But with respect to precision, we have shown that there is a, a, a an exponential gain. Basically, this where, where the scaling of different algorithms like phase estimation goes as one by the precision. For us, it goes as log of one by the precision. So with these techniques, we are actually trying to bring, bring on board an idea of how to solve the problem on quant, uh, of quantum chemistry problems on uh, hardware, but where we take a different approach. We do not directly map the quantum Hamiltonian to the hardware. We try to use the classical techniques that are already available to process the information that we're going to put on the, on the quantum hardware. And that is where we get a significant advantage in terms of the different scalings. So basically, the idea of downfolding is that you plug in your Hamiltonian and you should be able to get the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. That's the output. So this is the Hamiltonian. And then a downfolding approach would mean that you'd be able to reduce the dimension of your active space in a systematic manner. And in the process of doing so, you gather more and more information of the energy spectrum. So we can do that and reduce the matrix size of the Hamiltonian and also the number of uh, orbitals. And while doing so, we obtain the updated coefficients of the new Hamiltonian, which is an idea of denormalization. But it comes back in a uh, in a very interesting way while we are doing on, on quantum hardware, where we basically say that we up input the one step Hamiltonian, we get the next step renormalized Hamiltonian as an output. And then we plug it back again. And then we get another next level renormalized Hamiltonian. And keep on doing so, we get to the small small Hamiltonian, but whilst we also gather the energy of the system along the way. So in this way, we can gather the ground state energy and also the ground state wave function. So all of that can be recreated using this approach uh, by uh, not using a large number of qubits as is, which scales with physically with the physical system size, but rather scales logarithmically with it. So there is a saving in terms of space complexity as well as gate complexity. So this is the kind of comparison that we have between the qubitized phase estimation. So qubitized phase estimation is already something that is the state of the art in quantum phase estimation. When the concept of qubitization came in, it greatly reduced the gate complexities for phase estimation. So we are doing comparisons with that when we are doing comparison for downfolding. This is a workflow like that basically we start with a, a set of uh, coefficients which uh, form the prima facie of, a, sorry, of an electronic Hamiltonian. That is a one electron and the two electron tensor, which is basically the kinetic energy and the electronic correlation potentials. And then we plug that in. We, we solve something called a block equation. And that block equation solution, basically, we are able to map it. We are, map, we are able to map a quantum, a, a, a quantum operator expression is to an algebraic expression by analytical techniques. And then we are taking those algebraic equations and trying to solve them on quantum using the quant uh, using the quantum linear system problem at its heart and that is where we're using block encoding and other techniques to in, in order to speed up the operations we have been able to also show that this approach is size extensive which is the very which is at the very heart of any quantum chemistry calculation which is 
uh, which is uh, which is done so that uh, basically you can uh, capture the reaction kinetics correctly. So this is one nice scaling that we have shown for the hydrogen chain, where basically we say that let's take a hydrogen chain and start from uh, a system of 10 hydrogen atoms on a chain to a system of 100 hydrogen atoms on a chain, and then compute how the number of qubits grow in order to, for simulating the systems on quantum, and also get the number of Toffoli gates with the number of hydrogen atoms. What are the number of Toffoli gates you require to simulate them? So basically, we have obtained uh, scalings for the for those quantities, and also we have obtained an additional scaling, which is something that in qubitized phase estimation depends on the level spacing uh, of the system under consideration. Uh, so it's very hard to calculate. It depends on two very important quantities: that what is the overlap of your initial wave function to the exact one. That quantity comes into play, and also another quantity comes into play is the level spacing. So, uh, but since the way we are doing it in qubitized downpolling, it's a renormalization approach. So level spacing is uh, not a, not that difficult for us because what happens is that as we scale by reducing the number of orbitals, we actually uh, in, enhance the level spacing. And in the process of doing so, we get very stable solutions. So therefore, the runtime that we are uh, is the all has one type of scale. Uh, we have uh, in the hydrogen numbers, but this will change. The factors are very much in the chemical system in the study. And uh, what we've shown is that the you can see that we get 10n to the power 10 by 3 uh, exponent. Uh, so we have shown that uh, our number. Your voice is breaking. Hello. 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 Yeah. Hello. Uh, you may continue. Your internet connection seems a bit uh, fuzzy. So no. Yes, you may continue. Okay. Uh, do you see the slide now on the hydrogen chain, or is it some other slide you're seeing? Yes, we are seeing the slide on hydrogen chain using qubitized output. Uh, I'll try to go slide that is lower than graphics probably. So, yeah, we show the complexities are much better. Uh, hello excuse me dr anilvan your your voice is breaking uh, hello is it is it better now? no actually Complexity goes and the only particular login complexity, uh, space complexity, the top complexity is also uh, in terms of the precision. So basically, we have exponential advantage in terms of precision over the classical approach and polynomial advantage. Hello, Dr. Onirman. Your voice is breaking still now. So we can't hear you properly. Uh, 
डॉक्टर नॉनवेज में नॉलेज है या लुक्स लाइक ही इज फेसिंग सम प्रॉब्लम यस सर यस सर and we can't be sure if he can hear us or not Dancer. so yeah it is party so we 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 can request him to log out and join in again for like one more try because it's see i think it's any message maybe you need to call him over the phone yeah, yeah, mobile yeah. i am sending him a message let's see um. he is probably saying to wind up yes i think so yeah we can thank him on ayan yes left so yes sir sir so, uh, we can wait i think a minute if he rejoins uh, no 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 he, he has left okay okay he has wound up okay 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 yeah. so yes we can thank dr anirban mukherjee uh, for this talk unfortunately for his internet connection i think uh, we can't take any questions so moving i uh, i think we can move on to our next speaker uh, mr nikhil mithaliya are you there Uh, yeah i'm here so yes can you share can you start sharing your screen uh certainly yeah so yes uh let me know once you can see the screen yes of course we, yes we can see it. all right so uh let me introduce uh, the participants to mr nikhil mithaliya he is currently the general manager for tabor electronics in india where he leads research and development activities for the global r&d center and oversees the commercial organization in india with over 15 years of experience in the test and measurement industry Nick, uh, mr nikhil has been actively involved in numerous application support and col and collaborating with prestigious organizations such as the uh, indian space research organization and defense research and development organization centers of india in recent years nikhil has developed a keen interest in quantum technologies he has gained valuable working experience in the field of control electronics for quantum computing his expertise extends to developing and integrating complete quantum computing systems and he also excels as a solution provider in, in this domain so with this i request mr nikhil to take over the floor you can start it all right yeah thank you very much uh first would like to thank and uh, express my gratitude to the team to have me here and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, our uh, newest division which we started on the focusing specifically on the quantum solutions so let me start a uh, uh, start of my presentation with it in interest of time i will be a little quick so uh no one has to hold up till late evening all right so a uh, quickly who we are we uh tabor is israel based organization uh, started 1971 uh, we have been uh, specialized in designing signal sources uh, complex sources so that you can say is in our dna earlier we we have been doing a lot of uh, oems to keep test and measurement providers uh, so that's why we were at the back side of the uh, you can say not a customer front ending but back into the team in terms of uh, designing and developing and manufacturing this uh, 
So far, uh, what we have started later on is um, uh, branding uh, our branded products, Tabor branded. And as you can see, we have been developing for almost all the uh, leading test and measurement uh, uh, companies, uh, starting with, uh, say, Keithley in 1975, uh, Teletyne, which is Licroy, Applied Materials, uh, Keysight, Rodin Source. And uh, in 2019, we, our focus was majorly on to the focusing on Tapper branded products only. And that's where we started. Uh, uh, global presence as a direct and we opened the office in India and uh, this year beginning we have opened the uh, uh, R&D center also so as you can see we have so far like right, direct presence available in US, uh, Europe, uh, Israel where is our headquarter and uh, India uh, and China so the majority R&D happens of the hardware is in Israel uh, and the rest of the research part of it happens in uh, US and India. Uh, in India also, we are trying to get it into the lot of uh, hardware uh, R&D also in the second phase, uh, once my first phase is going to complete it. And uh, this is just a little photo of uh, our global development center, which has been opened. Uh, Sri Nilesh Desai has come and inaugurated the office and he was having a look on to the uh, on left side, you can see uh, he's holding one of the control electronics, uh, which fits into the system of quantum computing for superconducting qubits. Right. Uh, with that, uh, I'll just move on to the uh, uh, talks on to the superconducting qubits. We have uh, we have a lot of papers which we have published uh, in terms uh, quantum technology uh, and quantum sensors also, but in terms of time, like well, we're just talking on to the superconducting qubits. Uh, with the proud, we can say, as you can see here in the uh, photo, of this very much first uh, computer built by the IBM, and uh, he this this is uh, this has been taken in the uh, Fortune magazine and uh, backside. Uh, you can see those are the uh, Tabor as uh, control electronics hardware, which so we have been like, uh, you know, in the control electronics, wherever key role were there uh, since beginning into the quantum physics. Our idea is and the main motivation is to uh, reduce the size of this control electronics and uh, also uh, reduce the price uh, so that it can be it can become affordable. So that's our reason. And uh, currently we have within six centimeter, we can have a four qubit system, uh, which is which can have a control electronics, uh, uh, sorry, control uh, pulse as well as readout pulse and uh, readout pulse receiver side. And uh, we can scale it up, up to the thousands of qubits. With the recent uh, advan uh, advancement, we in the iron trap based quantum computer, we are developing a mesh network, which in which uh, one of the startup in Israel they have asked us to uh, develop the each qubit uh, trans receiver can be a master, and then next time can another uh, can also be a master and slave. So it completely a mesh topology which requires a tight synchronization at the FPGA level between uh, multiple uh, qubits. Uh, which is driving. So we are starting with the 40 qubit system, uh, synchronizing with uh, multiple this backend computing devices. Uh, these are running in the PCI, uh, PCI Gen 3 architecture currently. Uh, so this is what a typical quantum uh, superconducting quantum computing system looks like. Right? So it will require a pulse generator uh, where we generate the qubit states. And then we uplift onto the a microwave resonance frequency on which the qubit has been designed and uh, we send the control frequency and then we excite the state and then again uh, we send the readout pulse so the state we can read it back uh, through the isolator back into the uh, detector side and our classical computer will sit with the algorithm so there are several components, which is like a microwave section, then the dilution refrigerator, then the cryogenic components, as well as some accessories to get it in. 
and a lot of other accessories. Uh, the typical challenges which you will see with the setup is going to be uh, the phase discontinuity, which is majorly uh, anyone will undergo. And the warm up and cooling uh, cooling time period of the dilution refrigerator. So you, uh, for the experiment part of it, we have to tune in the INQ signals from the any of the hardware generator, whether it can be a FPGA source or it can be a dedicated instruments. From there, we have to ensure about the torque which has been given, and uh, if any of any of the human errors comes in, the cable is like you know not perfectly matched. Then there is a phase discontinuity comes in and then we run the whole experiment uh, at the end we find out a problem and then again we have to uh, you know the dilution refrigerator has been warm up and then again we have to give a cooling time so this this involves a lot of complexity a lot of cabling the other challenge is um, you you have seen the there is a local oscillator which is going into the mixer mixer is a quite a non-linear device uh, in RF. So it has a multiple uh, component at the output. Uh, if the mixer is not properly, you know, uh, it is saturated, then it will also have a lot of other harmonics. The power level will go into the harmonics and subharmonics, which has started interfering into the uh, system. And uh, we will not get exactly the state of the qubit at the receiver side. Right. So that is another problem with the complexity associated with the uh, external IQ mixer. The, since it is in analog in nature, uh, we do not have, we have to have uh, proper uh, filters to uh, uh, design to only pass through the resonance frequencies and uh, delta into the readout frequencies, right? The other part is uh, when the single qubit system and when it comes to the multiple multiple qubit systems, the local oscillator which is providing into this uh, uh, mixer, that also has to be synchronized. If they are also freely running on the different phase over the time period, of course, when we use uh, the 10 megahertz clock synchronization between multiple instruments, they just, uh, they just ensure that the phase where it begins at the starting of it but later over the stability and over the period of time, the phase uh, destabilizes. So there are also a lot of problems and uh, many, uh, you can say the results are going to take a little longer time. So uh, considering that, what uh, we come up with is the idea is like uh, direct uh, to microwave frequency and uh, fully digital system. So. We developed the FPGA based architecture, which has the uh, again the tags, multiple multiple tags and multiple EDCs, which has uh, digital up converters and digital down converters on both the side. So every error can be uh, you can uh, actually uh, put back into the FPGA to compensate that, and uh, we can control uh, every other output with a phase. Uh, uh, phase good phase resolution of it. Uh, typically, the tech uh, phase resolution comes in like two, uh, 32 bit increment. So, if you really want to tune it into the phase of the block sphere, about like let's say micro radian, we will be able to do it. So, the it removes out a lot of complexity as you can see from the previous diagram, uh, which is here. Uh, it's just a single unit and uh, multiple qubit. Uh, now, the resonance uh, which we have carried out with respect to the experiment is in uh, is in order of like uh, 5, 5.5 gigahertz and uh, another one readout was it on to the uh, six, uh, I guess again, uh, another 10 megahertz difference between these two. So we have used the accurate filters uh, to certainly allow our main phase Nyquist zone of the DAC and that goes mainly into the qubit drive state. So uh, this is the main qubit which we, the measurement has been carried out at 10 millikelvin on the different state. Uh, these are the cryo components which we have used uh, again with the filter and the attenuator. Uh, the power level which is re reaching to the qubit was somewhere, somewhere in order of uh, minus 120 dBm. And uh, the another channel we have used uh, which is going to be the readout uh, goes back into the qubit state same and through the isolator we read it back onto our digitizer. Now how do we do it? 
So again, we will have a classical computer. Uh, we use uh, Python or MATLAB as an open source uh, example, and that drives uh, our main pulses, uh, which are the pulse sequences, Gaussian pulse sequences that we can put it into the memory, and uh, that memory will be loaded into the onboard uh, memory available on uh, this transceiver systems, and uh, we we can load the sequences one after the other. We can uh, carry out the experiment. Now, uh, this is how exactly the day set up. So you can see uh, <coughs> it's really a small box, which is uh, having a four qubit systems, uh, the dilution refrigerator. And then uh, this is the main qubit, uh, which is having the readout and the qubit drive states, which we have been used. And this is the control electronics part, which is uh, which have been used into the uh, looking at to the top level side, as you can see, this is the customized FPGA, which we have our main IP on it. Uh, this is having a programmable uh, logic, uh, which we have implemented uh, specifically uh, to uh, taking in mind, like for the quantum sensor specifically part of it, where we require lock-in uh, lock lock amplifiers to detect the right phase and then lock to the uh, same frequencies. So we have designed right on board to reduce again the complexity of the setup. Uh, this particular uh, block, which is available, can be uh, user programmable also. So uh, if someone who is expert onto the FPGA and they want to test directly dump real time processing onto the qubits, uh, they can use still our uh, DAC, ADCs, then the PCI and memory, uh, all algorithms along with their IPs to uh, just make a a dedicated control uh, electronics part. So uh, the tech which is uh, running at uh, 16 bits and uh, uh, having a 16 bits of uh, a vertical resolution 9 giga samples uh, that has a built-in digital uh, up converter. Uh, as you can see, it is quite small, but uh, we have two different NCOs as in local oscillators, which helps us to control the phase of it. Uh, both are individual for I and Q, so that even to tune and uh, calibrate uh, both horizontal uh, upspin and downspin, we can easily able to tune with a good resolution of it. Uh, sequencing uh, to load all different uh, pulse waveforms and pulse sequences, and uh, we can program it uh, to one after the other. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the segment will be each memory segment will be played, or the uh, definition can be done. Uh, this is the open library of uh, the Python algorithm, uh, where you can just need to specify uh, which how channel you are using and what is the frequencies and the phase of it, and uh, what is the uh, mode of it of operation. So other definitions we can give in terms of uh, pulse characteristics directly. So that will uh, help to characterize uh, system very fast. Uh, other is a lot of customer likes this open source because uh, they want to come and test their algorithms directly rather having like a niche software uh, giving a functionality. All right. Once done, like uh, digitizer will help to digitize the data directly. And uh, uh, this can again turn at the microwave frequencies uh, having uh, uh, specifically on order of uh, uh, digital down converters. So digital down converters will help us to bring back the complex IQ data. And uh, uh, we have a FPGA real-time qubit state uh, measurement. So it will directly go from here to the qubit uh, measurement real-time processing on it. Uh, this is what I was talking about, the custom uh, uh, FPGA implementation. So. Uh, we can still we use the Xilinx FPGAs and uh, we can dump the customized code, uh, which helps us to do a real time processing with it. Uh, what it makes like the, the classical, uh, like the ideal use of the control electronics. So, uh, as you can see, like we require a multiple channel tag. So, we have it on there. Then, uh, detector. So, we have a two ADCs on this. Uh, then that requires the control uh, signals as well as the trigger input. So we have the DIO uh, markers as well as the trigger in and trigger input, 
to control the pulses and then the high speed interface to do uh, processing part of it all right and then a real time processor which is uh, xilinx fpga which we are using and along with the onboard memory to store the data so this is the flow of it and uh, we have carried out some measurements so as you can see here this is the uh, qubit spectroscopy uh, to find out the uh, exit what is the frequency and this is the t2 ramsey measurement uh, again to find out what x uh, detuning frequency and its decay uh, we have done so far the longest uh, uh, t2 t1 typically uh, people are doing uh, hours of data but for T2 relaxation time, like we have done uh, in order of uh, 90 seconds, uh, which helps to uh, make a very fine tuned uh, uh, measurements in terms of spectroscopy. Uh, so we closely work with uh, currently uh, University of Berkeley. Uh, there is one Indian professor, Ajoy Ashok. Uh, so this is his lab uh, where NMR nuclear spin based uh, quantum uh, spectroscopy we are developing and uh, uh, this is the whole solutions which is coming up with uh, uh, the complete uh, uh, control electronics then the amplifiers and probe and uh, magnet uh, the complete system will looks like this so this is the first outcome of our uh, uh, you can say in terms of uh, quantum sensors and uh, this is what i was talking about like uh, 90 seconds long we could able to achieve it without changing the magnet size also uh, however you require have you make a larger magnet uh, you will be able to get a more power and then you can take a fine tuning but we come up with uh, this long memory architecture and the processing which helps us to without changing the magnet uh, you can still able to achieve the same results so that's all I have. Uh, we, I have other things to present, which is onto the uh, uh, specifically on nitrogen vacancy based, uh, also diamond center. But uh, if anyone requires some more knowledge on it, uh, or what is what could be the day setup, please, uh, you can feel free to ping me. Yeah, so thank you very much for this talk, Mr. Mithalia. Uh, so the participants can unmute themselves and ask if they have any questions. Hi. Um, are you like a reseller for Tabor in India? Uh, no, I am from Tabor. Isn't Tabor based in Israel? Yeah, yeah. Tabor is an uh, Israel based organization, yes. So, but you are like running the Indian. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, any more questions? So if there are no more questions, let us thank once again, Mr. Mithalia for this talk. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So moving on to our next speaker, we have Dr. Manjuna. Dr. Manjuna, are you there? Uh, yes. Yeah. So you can share your screen. Sure. In the meantime, uh, let me introduce uh, all the participants. Uh, Dr. Manjunath. Dr. Manjunath Venkatesh completed his MS and PhD from Tudelt, Netherlands, with specialization in microelectronics. He has more than seven years' experience in CMOS and MEMS, wafer scale process development at Tudelt EKL Foundry. At QTech Intel and IQM Finland, he worked on the process development and characterization of superconducting qubit based quantum processors. He has four granted patents with two patents under review and seven scientific publications. At QPy AI, he is working on developing the full stack quantum computer for superconducting and semiconducting qubits. So, with this, uh, I request Dr. Manjula to take over the floor. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, thanks uh, thanks for uh, uh, giving opportunity to present in this uh, uh, top industry collaboration so uh, i would like to mention about uh, uh, the work we do at uh, cupi ai so cupi ai is a bangalore based startup uh, working on uh, ai and quantum enterprise level solution here mainly we work for, we focus on uh, uh, solving uh, very computationally complex uh, problems using uh, ai and quantum solutions and along with that we also want to uh, vertically integrate the uh, quantum hardware with the high level quantum software systems so our motto is uh, mainly uh, three aspects uh, to build a, a solution of, for complex computation problems uh, in uh, logistics, finance, supply chain industries, uh, pharma industries uh, using AI and quantum technologies, and also help uh, enterprises to go towards quantum adaption, uh, adoption uh, by uh, we provide the algorithm framework for their business use cases, uh, quantum software uh, libraries, and also integrated with our, our uh, with the cloud these quantum computers or the work uh, which we are doing uh, in bringing up our own quantum computing hardware. Uh, so why uh, quantum? So basically, uh, why quantum and AI in, in specifically? So basically, uh, we have seen that uh, the AI, uh, AI, um, uh, the flow of AI in solving so very large computational problems is already been proven in the industry, and that is through deep learning uh, based uh, systems. Now, the next generation would system would be an hybrid of quantum and AI algorithms and solutions, and that is where you can go to a higher uh, amount of speed of solutions to get with higher uh, calculation accuracy this is both in in specific industries uh, for optimization use cases uh, machine learning uh, problems uh, problem space and also for uh, 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 drug discovery uh, uh, finding new molecules in these aspects uh, and hybrid quantum and ai approach can provide better solution uh, uh, accuracy and also the faster speed to solution so how uh, uh, with respect to our ai platform um, so we we have our own uh, enterprise level uh, ai suit which is called as a cupi ai pro this is an end to end uh, ai 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 auto ml and uh, ml ops platform so basically what it does is uh, it is it has a built in uh, mm -hmm. Uh, library framework for discovering uh, models to uh, customers and our clients use cases so basically these uh, this entire suit can, uh, solutions can be installed in data in their own data centers or on the cloud based platform so it has a automated approach to uh, de uh, developing and uh, deploying ai models that is through our knowledge discovery platform that can take any amount of data in text uh, we, uh, in text basis vision basis or audio basis and prepare it very specifically to uh, the client's use case in specific industries. And our own uh, patented model discovery platform uh, discovers new mo uh, models that are more energy efficient, ba uh, uh, basically efficiency in terms of uh, the compute platform that has to be deployed and also um, uh, how to uh, have uh, best models to it. We have more than 200 plus AI models that is placed in this, and this forms the entire suit. So in a similar fashion, uh, we see that our quantum platform also would work when uh, addressing various business solutions so how how our quantum uh, uh quantum solution approach to our industry customers is through these uh, uh, these approaches so mm -hmm. basically we work with across several industries uh, right from um, uh, the manufacturing industries to banking and financial services pharma and also automotive aerospace so in this uh, we we as uh, we we work with them to uh, uh, to develop solutions based on our own software framework uh, that can run on near-term uh, GPUs and ASICs, and it can also run on quantum computers. So basically, our uh, approach is uh, to provide solutions in the software stack of or the legacy stack of the of, of our customers uh, to work uh, in the optimization use case, and also uh, provide them that they can use their own infrastructure to run these algorithms and solutions. But also when a quantum computer uh, uh, it can be easily mapped onto a quantum computer in this way uh, they don't need to change uh, several aspects in their uh, uh, full uh, in their libraries or in their uh, in their workflow but we integrate our uh, quantum uh, quantum enhanced workflow into their stack so that is uh, our approach to working with our various various customer uh, in terms of our full stack solution so basically
actually uh, what we as I, as I said that we are developing a full stack quantum computer uh, in India so mainly focused on superconducting based qubit for a 25 qubit to a very scalable quantum computer uh, st uh, currently with a 25 or 50 qubit quantum processor and then uh, scaling up to 300 qubits so this um, uh, this is our approach in the quantum processor development and our uh, control electronics is uh, mainly both the both the room temperature and cryogenic electronic systems uh, that we are working on uh, to control our uh, application specific quantum processors and that can be uh, mapped to our uh, algorithms and uh, libraries to provide quantum computing as a service uh, business model to our uh, customers so this is the approach we are taking we mainly focus on application specific approach uh, rather than a general purpose uh, con uh, com quantum computing so we uh, which is mainly focused on optimization use cases or machine learning use cases and also the pharma industry so as I mentioned, uh, the approach which we take in our full stack approach is uh, right from uh, developing uh, and designing our own quantum processor for industry use case. And then uh, we, we interface it to our control hardware system, both at the cryogenic uh, IC electronics close to the quantum processors and also our room temperature electronics to provide uh, microwave uh, signals to the quantum processor. And this is mapped to our uh, quantum circuit compiler that is uh, very, uh, uh, what customized to, uh, to, uh, to increase is the efficiency of running quantum algorithms on uh, custom designed quantum processors and then uh, that is mapped to uh, libraries in the optimization sector uh, machine learning and uh, quantum simulations for um, uh, for drug discovery and pharma industry currently we evaluated this stack from the top down approach in, with our own uh, quantum uh, simulators which can uh, do up to 20 qubit simulators in house built uh, uh, density matrix simulators and uh, also with noise so in this way we uh, evaluate our uh, our algorithm team and software teams evaluate the uh, business use cases on these simulators and then uh, in the near term when we have our uh, we bring in our quantum computer we we give this compute time on the cloud or also be able to deploy it on premise uh, with respect to our quantum software libraries, so as I mentioned, we, we have three types of uh, libraries, mainly uh, quantum inspired solution, which is called as QPI Opt, which is uh, work for industry uh, ready applications. Uh, our machine learning and uh, quantum simulation libraries mainly focused on uh, machine learning use cases and also for uh, in the quantum uh, simulation is for material simulation use cases uh, that is uh, preferably for this one. And these are uh, ready to in integrate software uh, with the legacy stack of the industries and then which we can deploy along with that uh, we also work in the uh, education sector so we we develop uh, uh, our own uh, quantum circuit simulator and interactive learning tools to help uh, 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 deploy uh, learning solutions uh, to teach uh, to teach university students and also industry professional in the in the field of quantum computing and to show them how enterprise adoption of quantum computing solution can help their various business use cases these are the various sectors and uh, uh, use case uh, and uh, uh, solutions that we have deployed uh, with our customers, uh, mainly uh, right from route optimization and scheduling with our uh, supply chain and logistic platform, uh, carbon capture and network design optimization, uh, and so uh, and for um, uh, for be for better. Uh, uh, better storage of carbon capture and uh, supplying through the network. And then uh, sensor position optimization, warehouse optimization. Uh, in the banking sector, we worked on um, uh, portfolio optimization, uh, default prediction, arbitrage sequentially, and also in the material discovery with uh, with respect to protein ligand interaction with our, uh, uh, with our quantum libraries for material and drug discovery. So these are the use cases that we have already deployed at our, with our clients. And we work with uh, several uh, international and international clients uh, mainly uh, across various industries uh, in the in the vehicle uh, routing with the ZF group uh, across Europe and uh, Siemens in the manufacturing sectors, Murata Electronics uh, in the supply chain logistics uh, sector, Japanese company, and with the various pharma company like Eli Lilly uh, and uh, Repsol, along with uh, our financial uh, customers like Standard Chartered and American Express. So these are uh, some of the solutions that we work with our clients. So basically, a quantum inspired solution solution has shown that uh, uh, this is the pan-European pickup and delivery uh, logistic operation. Uh, we have uh, shown that our solution reaches 72 times faster uh, and it can reduce up to 40% in the total cost saved and 60% uh, of uh, reduce, uh, reduction in the average distance traveled by the vehicles. So these solutions are uh, basically uh, 
can also be deployed to uh, Pan India solution. We're also working with Mahindra Logistics uh, where they have uh, 60,000 orders per day and they want to minimize the cost per uh, kg that can be transported during uh, when they have to plan their network delivery operation. So this is one, one application of a quantum inspired optimization library. And we have shown our benchmark with the industry standard uh, tool set that is Microsoft Azure Quantum D-Wave and Toshiba uh, library, uh, Toshiba systems, uh, which, uh, which uh, for quantum inspired uh, optimization libraries. And we have see, shown that our solution is like up to 10, 12 X faster for 1 million node problems in case of uh, D-Wave uh, uh, quantum annealers. And with respect to Microsoft and Azure Quantum uh, inspired solution, our solution is about 100 times faster. In this way, uh, we compare, uh, very uh, with the we have benchmark with the industry standard solution and this is and on, not only this we also help uh, our customers to deploy this in their uh, in their traditional software stack to show performance in their uh, applications and with respect to banking in our domain, we have worked uh, with uh, uh, several banks in uh, portfolio optimization, uh, default prediction, fraud detection, and anti-malign laundering. And uh, this is the machine learning problem set, and we have shown advantages of using quantum machine learning uh, in their uh, in their uh, in their use cases and the and the boost and the uh, speed ups that can be seen uh, with respect to both using uh, uh, quantum uh, machine learning problem set uh, for a large number of features. Uh, it can be seen that it shows up to 30x speed up and 5% improvement in accuracy. So there are two aspects, uh, two benchmark that they see is how, how much speed up it is, how it can reduce their uh, computation cost time. And also the accuracy of solution is it has actually accurate to the classical solution. Here we compare both the classical solution XG boost with our quantum XG boost and we show that our uh, uh Accuracy is very close and better to the cl classical accuracy. And with respect to speed up, uh, we can, uh, with respect to the training time, which takes for a long time for a classical solution, a quantum solution, uh, near uh, we get very low, uh, uh, much faster uh, training uh, with when we go for a QC boost kind of uh, machine learning solution. Uh, with respect to uh, a, uh, various industry in, in terms of telecom industry, we have shown that uh, our quantum inspired solution can work in the uh, telecom network design uh, capacity planning and network congestion and minimization. Uh, with respect to, we have optimized the uh, network in terms of telecommunication network. We took the initial initial network uh, system and showed the most optimized uh, um, uh, network system that can be produced uh, with, with more than 51% cost reduction. So basically as it's optimization use case, uh, we have uh, constraints that can be added to these uh, use cases and then it can be uh, shown to be much faster uh, to time to solution than uh, finding it in a traditional uh, CPU based classical solution. With respect to material discovery and film, we worked in across all sectors of the drug discovery pipeline. So in the initial phase uh, where target identification is necessary, and then we use heat uh, and the heat generation for molecular uh, dynamics, uh, where we apply some of the quantum inspired and quantum solution to boost the uh, like computation time. And finally, uh, lead optimization, uh, property prediction and uh, comparative modeling uh, to, find, uh, to show that in the drug discovery pipeline, adding quantum solution can help in uh, improving the, uh, the time to solution and also accuracy of solution. Uh, this is one of the use cases uh, for the combinatorial drug discovery pipeline where uh, we have shown that uh, by using quantum inspired algorithm and solutions, uh, we can uh, tune the uh, and uh, we can design new drugs with certain targeted uh, properties and we can explore very exponentially large uh, uh, spaces which have more than billions of molecules and um, uh, this, this can be handled well, very well in our quantum inspired libraries which is, uh, uh, which is mapped onto a cubo problem set and then uh, based on the constraints we find the solutions so this is uh, we have shown that it is um, um, more speed up um, it is 100x uh, much faster than the classical solution with respect to our, as I mentioned, uh, the, I discussed about the quantum software solution in different use cases in the industry. And then when we ma map to a hardware-based system, uh, our, we have uh, automated the uh, 
mapping the quantum algorithm software to generate optimized quantum circuits uh, that can be run on very near term devices. As you know, the qubit uh, coherence time is much lower, but uh, in order to run much efficient algorithms, you have to work on the compiler level to uh, develop, uh, 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 to map the circuits in such a way that uh, it can run um, a large amount of circuits and more efficiently. So this is our uh, automized uh, uh, mappings quantum software to quantum circuits for near term uh, NIST devices. And the other aspect is uh, which we work on, uh, as you know, that room temperature electronics uh, requires a lot of electronics system that needs to do for characterizing a superconducting qubits. Uh, there is one requirement that if you can integrate this onto a single platform uh, and it can be, uh, it can ha handle much large number of qubits. Uh, so we have uh, developed our own uh, qubit control and readout platform that can, uh, which doesn't use a mixer operations, uh, require mix mixers for up conversion up to eight to nine gigahertz but it has a direct synthesis of uh, frequencies up to 8 gigahertz and this can be uh, do doable with uh, integrated up to 16 channels and also we have integrated some ai functionality for calibrating qubits as uh, as uh, just calibrating qubits is very important before you run the algorithms on it uh, so this way an ai ml qubit calibration can help in uh, you know uh, for making um, uh, the calibration much faster uh, our uh, aspects in the development of this room temperature electronics that it has more number of channels and it can uh, directly synthesize uh, uh, the uh, the qubit frequencies without the need of mixer operations. And these are some of our uh, platform uh, where a user can control the control and read out the quantum um, uh, uh, channels uh, with respect to a, a Python based environment. They can uh, map the frequencies and also set uh, various Gaussian pulses respect to the qubit frequencies. Uh, these are some experiments with uh, resonator based systems uh, to show how to map, uh, how to do qubit, uh, similar to a qubit measurements, qubit spectroscopy or resonator spectroscopy, some of the experiments uh, with our hardware based system. And uh, our main focus is as we have built uh, our solutions in all the quantum uh, software space, we want to make it efficient towards the control hardware and a quantum processor stack where we are building industry specific quantum processors and uh, that can be easily scalable uh, in a fair, fair. Uh, up to 300 qubits. So we start off with our 25 and 50 qubits. Uh, we build this quantum computer system at a facility here in Bangalore. And then we try to uh, deploy also this quantum computing system across various um, uh, industries uh, based on their requirement. It's more customizable to their requirement. That is the focus of our approach towards quantum computing as a service model. And along with that, our long-term roadmap is to develop more uh, cryogenic-based uh, uh, controllers that can be uh, solve the bottleneck of, uh, of the wiring problem. Uh, so we are working with um, uh, adding a lot of functionalities at the cryogenic at the 4K level. Uh, then, and along with that, we want to work towards uh, a more uh, fundamental research towards uh, scheme or spin qubits, where uh, we can try to uh, make us qubits that are uh, slightly at high temperature, about two Kelvin, uh, so that they can be integrated with control apps. That is our long-term vision to see how spin qubits can be also done with the scalable approach. And our, uh, as, as uh, we have worked through our timeline for the past two, three years that uh, we, uh, we have developed our own solution set uh, and we are now building our own quantum computer for industry specific use cases. And then our long-term goal is to manufacture uh, our own quantum processes uh, by developing a foundry process uh, 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 in India so that it can be beneficial uh, for, uh, for various industries to have their own designs being fabricated uh, in our foundry. And our team, uh, basically, it's a, a very uh, strong team in both AI and quantum. Uh, we have about uh, uh, 40 plus strong engineering team, 10 patents filed in uh, Cupa AI. Uh, and we have a very um, led by Dr. Nagendra Pagaraj, who PhD in AI and wireless, about 25 years in experience in NVIDIA Qualcomm. And we have a lot of uh, experts uh, from various sectors in quantum algorithms and theory, quantum hardware, and um, uh, quantum software. And that is uh, uh, our uh, uh, story in terms of our uh, technology and we have advisors both uh, international India and abroad uh, mainly from Indian Institute of Science uh, Professor Nal Khan but Ujjal Sain uh, uh, Shiva Shankar and also from Oxford University's Professor Andrew Wicks and uh, Vishal from Controlox. 
Uh, second aspect is that not only at the solution and working with enterprises, we are very well focused in developing the quantum ecosystem in India with respect to education and learning. So we built, it's more than two, uh, two years platform uh, where we teach uh, AI and quantum with, uh, ha- with uh, hands-on experiments with uh, quantum hardware and quantum simulators. We have more than 20,000 students uh, enrolled in this platform. Uh, we, uh, we, have, uh, we have specialized uh, course modules in both uh, uh, basics of quantum mechanics, uh, quantum software, quantum algorithms, and also teach uh, teach about uh, learning about quantum uh, computing, qubits, superconducting, and semiconducting, and also run algorithms on real quantum courses with our uh, collaborator with Amazon Bracket. So anybody can uh, join this uh, course platform. It's freely available, and they can uh, start learning about the quantum computing. Uh, uh, across India, we have worked with a lot of uh, professors in this uh, quantum uh, com- Field, especially in Indian Institute of Science, uh, Professor Vibhor Balasidhasuri, Aisar uh, uh, Trivan, Trivandram, who uh, Professor Madhutalakam, who work on spin qubits, and uh, various uh, professors who have given uh, lectures on this platform. And also, we help students uh, to learn and uh, uh, with this, uh, both with industry specific use cases and also fundamental study. And we are uh, uh, we are mainly focused uh, as uh, been uh, in the Indian community and abroad that um, uh, many of the companies have quoted us. We are NASCOM our uh, emerging award winning 2021 awards uh, for the best uh, AI enterprise suit, and we are also working on building the first quantum computer in India. Yeah, that is uh, main uh, uh, work that we have done, and I can take questions uh, with respect to this one. Yeah, thank you. So thank you, Dr. Manjunath. Uh, participants can ask ask questions now. Uh, no, I have one uh, very general question, Dr. Manjunath. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, just can you tell me about the nature of quantum courses you are providing? Yeah. Is it uh, information science, or you also have a course on different quantum hardwares? Because the profile of speaker tutors are very nice. So I was curious. Yeah, so uh, uh, basically it's like a, a graduate level course. Like we start from the basics of uh, quantum mechanics, single qubit gates, uh, multi qubit gates, and then uh, we go to specific quantum algorithms. And then uh, the main uh, topic when we come to quantum hardware, uh, we have tutorials on uh, superconducting qubits and spin uh, spin qubits based system, how these work. Okay, and uh, uh, basically, uh, Based on that, uh, uh, we uh, to show how to write quantum algorithms on superconducting qubits uh, system, which can be accessed through Amazon bracket. So this is how we have uh, tailored this course. And uh, uh, it is like a self-study platform. And uh, uh, we regularly conduct a weekly uh, live, uh, live session of uh, asking doubts with our community. OK, thank you. Mm, I have one question. Uh, yes. uh, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, when you said uh, that you have deployed solution, mm-hmm. so does it mean that you uh, deployed quantum inspired solutions, which are working on classical computers? Yes, exactly. So we have deployed the quantum inspired solutions uh, because in the classical infrastructure, uh, it can boost the performance when compared to classical solution. We have deployed this, for example, uh, Pan India, uh, Mahindra Logistics applications, uh, we have reduced the time up to 40, uh, 40% cost. And this is running in this current software stack. So that is how the enterprise adoption takes place. Once you show the uh, so the benefit of quantum inspired solution, when you have a quantum computer, the, obviously the computation will run on the quantum quantum computer. It's easy to map these uh, without changing anything in the code base. So in that way, we are preparing enterprises on this. And yes, we have deployed quantum inspired optimization solution. Thank you. So are there any more questions? I think not. So we can thank again uh, Dr. Manjunath for this wonderful talk. Thank you. And we can move to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Manish Mudan. Are you here, Dr. Manish? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 we can hear you. So you can, yeah, we can see your slides too. So let me introduce uh, the participants to Dr. Manish Mudani. He has 17 and more years of experience in 
high performance computing and AI. He has ported and benchmarked applications of various domains, which includes weather, computational fluid dynamics, molecular ke uh, chemistry, and so on. Uh, recently, Dr. Manish has started working in quantum computing simulation and its acc acceleration. Dr. Manish's work is patented and published in various peer-reviewed journals. Prior to joining NVIDIA, he was the technical lead for India uh, at IBM. During his PhD from in, uh, IIT Delhi, Manish, uh, Dr. Manish has developed air pollution models for the dispersion of air pollutants in low wind conditions. Uh, so this session would be uh, uh, a presentation followed by a tutorial where he would discuss uh, accelerated computing and quantum simulations and demonstrate the advantage of GPU acceleration for quantum algorithms. So with this, I request Dr. Manish to start the session. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Amanita, for giving me a chance. Um, thanks, everyone, to staying late. Uh, today, I will discuss first about accelerated computing, give some background about NVIDIA, though I'm sure everyone might have heard about NVIDIA, but a little bit background. Then will come what we are doing in quantum computing. Basically, we are accelerating the process, what we spend time in simulations, as well as where we are heading that we know that uh, future is where high performance computing and quantum computing will work together. There will be integration, HPC and QC. So for there, the framework is ready. Then we have another offering where we have the low latency communication between HPC or you say accelerated system and quantum system. So that is another offering. Um, I will show some gain using GPUs, what we gain if we use the CPU only simulator versus uh, accelerated computing simulator, what is the gain? Uh, and then finally, I will demonstrate them live on the system, which anyone can reproduce later on on their system. Um, if uh, before starting, there is a, if someone needs system access to run these simulation for their research purpose or for anything, one can, uh, faculty member can connect to the uh, to CDEC or myself, I will route them to CDEC. CDEC has latest supercomputer, which is recently ranked as the 75th in the world. Um, they have a state-of-art computer and where all these uh, quantum uh, accelerations are available. So one can do the research work there. So with that, let me start. I um, would like to start with the giving the background of NVIDIA. So NVIDIA has a, started as a graphics card company in 1993. Um, still, you might be seeing on your laptop or anywhere that green color sticker is there and you have the graphics card uh, from NVIDIA. Certainly, if you all are enjoying the games, all games are on uh, NVIDIA graphics card, they are working. Um, with that graphics card in 2006, we came up with the CUDA framework, which exploited the graphics card uh, capabilities for number crunching. So what we do, any operation, any code we run, there is a number crunching and those graphics are being a start uses for um, number crunching. And that's where we start accelerating the HPC applications. Uh, with that acceleration, later on, we came up with the, uh, those acceleration were shown in the artificial intelligence from 2012 onwards, where the AlexNet competition was there. And it was demonstrated that using NVIDIA, uh, those AI uh, or deep learning based simulations are possible and that's where the AI journey started. And recently you all know the chat GPT came and now again the boom is there and all those things back backend work are going on with the NVIDIA GPU. Almost all countries and all major, um, all major companies or players like including Google, Microsoft, they are using NVIDIA GPU now uh, to do their day to day research and so on. So, so NVIDIA coming back, NVIDIA started with the graphics card, but now uh, we are into the process or we are delivering our GPU, accelerated card, our CPU, our data processing unit, our NIC card, we acquired the Mellanox, so we have network now. Um, all these possible because we have worked on so many applications which we use in our day to day. And then we know application required accelerations and how those can be performed. And that's where now we know how to tune hardware. So we are coming up with various kinds of systems, be it RTX, DGX, or 
systems, GPU enabled system with our partner, we call it HGX. Those could be Dell system, HP system and so on. Then the network based system EGX and the Omniverse or visualization OVX and so on. So all those kinds of hardwares are available. They support all kinds of GPUs. As I said, CUDA is our framework that run across all kinds of systems. And that's where you can run all the softwares. Performance matters what kind of GPU you are using, but it run across all the platforms, right? Then we have the soft system softwares where the CUDA comes into the picture, as well as we have system management tool like base command, fleet command, and so on. Then we come with that. We, we have the solutions for HPC. Um, there we use the our CUDA X that is meant to accelerate HPC applications. Then we have AI, and then we have Omniverse for visualization. And then with above layer, we develop many accelerations or many uh, accelerated SDKs or many frameworks which are readily available. One can use them. So then no need to bother about the bottom hardware and optimizations. Those frameworks like plug and play enables users to get the accelerated performance gain. And I can give you example like for uh, you all might be knowing the HPC applications like molecular dynamics, those applications gain um, on single node of CPU, one can go up to say 30 nanosecond per day, that is for Gromax or NAND or any application. But with GPU enabled system in one node, one can go about 120 nanosecond per day. That is a nanosecond per day is the unit used in the molecular dynamics, right? So that is the advantage we are experiencing now in day to day and all researchers are working. Few of the frameworks are given here. The modulus is uh, for HPC and AI. In general, AI frameworks are predicting based on data, but in scientific domain, we need the prediction based on the governing equations. So that's where the modulus, all governing equations are inbuilt here. One of the, my previous speaker talk about the governing equations. Uh, so all are inbuilt here. So all prediction based on governing equations goes in the modulus. It is being used in CFD weather and almost every domain. Then we have Clara Monet. It is being used in healthcare. Riva, that is uh, a speech uh, magazine. When you do meeting, automatically the uh, language get translated. Other guy here in their native language and you here in your lang native language and so on. We have Avatar, we have Drive, Auto Drive for Auto Car. We have Metropolis for a smart city. Hollow Scan, again for a scanning and medical imaging and so on. We are presenting here on the few. So, um, and these are around 3000 applications are already accelerated. So if you are working on any application, including quantum, which I will cover now, but you will see most of the work is already accelerated and you can easily use those applications. If those are available in container form as well as source code is also accelerated. Um, many of the researchers, um, majority of the researchers, they use the application and they try with different input and analyze the output with various conditions. In that case, containers are useful because container comes with a binary, compiled binary, optimized binary with the environment. So no need to compile the binary again, no need to have dependent library and anything again, just download the container and you can start using those containers. Someone would like to modify or work into the source code, then they need to work on source code. There also we give the detailed documentation, one can work on that, right? So there are around 30 million CUDA downloads and we have around 3 million CUDA developers across the world. And those are increasing rapidly day by day, particularly now with the large language models or chat GPT, they are increasing significantly. So since these are open source contribu contributions, these are going very fast and things are happening at fast pace. You might have heard now any domain, any department you are working in institutes or any industry, as I mentioned before to my previous speaker, we are almost in every domain. Every domain you will see there is an acceleration, the GPUs are being used, be it even recently we have pandemic COVID, uh, the vaccine or their simulations, they were done on GPU and that made things faster, quick turnaround. ML nowadays is not possible without GPU, I mean, they become synonym. Uh, synonymous, all kind of deep learning or artificial intelligence framework. I'm not going in uh, detail here, but any domain, 
any field you are working, the GPUs are there. The most majority of the applications are already ported and you should get advantage of that. Right? How things have started with GPU? Um, now, uh, earlier, every year, we used to get CPU performance, CPU frequency used to increase every year around 1980s. And accordingly, our application used to become faster, day by day faster, right? And then we were not bothering about the performance that time because that was going around 1.5x time faster that time and that was significant enough to work with. But later on, due to the constraint in the power energy requirement or the chip size requirement, there the increase in the frequency reduced. It became almost stagnant over the years, right? So there is no gain in the performance. And now that time the requirement to have quick turnaround was increasing. Uh, that includes even if you go on Google, want to see something, it has to be quick, right? The search has to be quick. Same on Amazon and everything. So that's where the, as I said, around 2006 onwards, the GPU uh, acceleration started. And now we are growing again 1.5 times faster. By 2025, we will be around 2000 times faster than CPU on an average for almost all, all the applications. How it works, um, we take any application, there is a, uh, that it starts on CPU, there's a data, um, data store or data reading from a file, that operation done on CPU. Then there is a number crunching part that could be 5%, 10% or 20% of the full application. That number crunching part or compute intensive part that's get offloaded on GPU and remaining all post-processing remain on CPU. But with that much offloading on GPU gives us significant speed up, right? What I was talking about. Um, as I mentioned, only even if we offload 5% of code, um, you get the significant speed. Up. How it is done? It is done three ways. As I said, many of the libraries are already available, like say, be it FFT, or be it your Kublas, or be it PyTorch, TensorFlow, any library, they are already accelerated version available. Just you replace your current version of the code with this accelerated library, you get the acceleration. And that includes even your quantum libraries, which I am coming now. Um, then there is another way to use OpenACC directives. These are the code instrumentation. You put some directives in the code, uh, and then code become accelerated uh, that is start exploiting the GPU capabilities and it, it becomes accelerated. Then last but not least, using programming language, which is our CUDA C, CUDA Fortran, CUDA Python, CUDA Julia now, and so on. So those languages, if you use, that gives the maximum flexibility and maximum scale. Right? But again, I would urge that whatever application you are working, if it's a commonly used, you may, give, you may see their GPU accelerated version in your day-to-day -day life and you can exploit that capabilities. This is one chart on an average, almost all the domains we have applications. One link is given here, uh, developerindia.com. You can go there and check your HPC applications as well as all, all major deep learning framework, PyTorch, TensorFlow, all are available. The message here, right side graph, we would like to show that we are, Every year we are, every two years we are coming up with our new hardware, but we do not stop with the hardware. We improvise our software stack as well. As I said, now we have end-to-end -end story. Uh, NVIDIA starts from hardware and we work on software also. So year to year, the performance increases by optimizing the software also, right? La right side, if you see 2017, our V100 GPU came and then 2020, we have A100, but still 2017 to 19, there was a significant performance gain by improving the software stack, right? And now last six years, we increase on an average from 8X to 250X speed up in comparison to CPU, what we run day by day. That is the background about, quick background about NVIDIA. I can talk a lot about that, but today our topic is quantum. So let's start the quantum journey. So quantum, uh, one thing what we realize is our the beauty is the system what we are using for HPC or AI, the same system can be used for quantum simulations. And that's where we are working. We have all the frameworks, leading frameworks, be it IBM, Google, Penny Lane, 
Rigetti, all the frameworks, they are available on our system. They are easily installable. And then they, with that, we accelerated those uh, and we shown the performance improvement, right? So that is uh, what we would like to say that one system can be used for multiple uh, objectives, like running your HPC applications, AI applications, or your quantum simulations uh, that can be done on uh, one system, GPU enabled system, right? Um, there we have three kind of offering. One is QQuantum. QQuantum is kind of library which accelerates all your simulators operations. Um, in simulation, mostly we use say UFT, Shore, Sycamore, Grower algorithm or AI side, say we use VQE and other algorithms. All are accelerated version available. Those one can use their CPU code, same, those sim simply replace them with GPU enabled call and they can see the performance. And those can be done on uh, and we need a GPU enabled system because we work on CUDA and then containers can be downloaded and those can be done. Right? The next we came up is our another offering and I will go one by one detail on this, but uh, overview wise, uh, we have another offering is CUDA Quantum. That is um, a framework. We know the future is HPC and quantum integrated or accelerated computing system plus quantum computing. Those will go hand to hand part of the code will be offloaded on quantum computer and the results will be taken back. That will be the operation in future. Since we know how to offload from CPU to GPU with our um, experience, we came up with the framework called CUDA Quantum that enables user to offload their part of the code on quantum computer and take the data back. Right? And right now, since the actual quantum computer available in limited terms, be it in terms of qubit or be it in terms of error and so on, right now that program can run on classical system only. Only at compile time, one has to give the option where they want to run, it will run. Or if you want to run actual quantum computer, their compile time options, just define the name, it will run. So what we are enabling right now, you develop your algorithm using this CUDA quantum framework same as it is algorithm can be used tomorrow on when actual quantum computer is available, right? The last offering is we have tie up with the quantum machines. There we work on the system where we will have low latency operations. When we offload from HPC system to quantum system, we know that quantum state is the key and holding that state is uh, critical. So that's where we came up with the hardware solution where the latency to offload the data from or exchange the communication between classical to quantum is very low. Today, I will discuss only first two topic, QQuantum library and CUDA quantum uh, framework. The third one uh, today in the interest of time, I will not discuss, but we can happy to take offline on this. Um, do not want to go deeper, but quantum simulation is important because we have, we need to develop algorithms. We need to analyze the future hardware. So simulations are important. Everyone is working on simulations. So let's start with the first, our offering is QQuantum, which is for simulations. Um, what QQuantum does is, uh, be it state vector, be it tensor net, uh, any, any kind of uh, qubits, those go, gets accelerated. It sits in the bottom line. Then the, there is a, uh, well-known simulation frameworks come into picture, be it CERC, Twiskit, Penilin, TensorFlow, Cubo, any framework, almost all are supported here. And above that, the algorithm comes. So for user, they are developing their algorithm. Right now, they might be running in one of the framework here. Simply, they need to change the syntax and they get the performance gain. Performance gain, I'm talking order of 100 times more. And as well as one NVIDIA system with eight GPU, here you can run, say, in modern system, you can run up to 36 qubit, state vector qubits in one system, which is not possible on CPU only system. They are, it's limited by memory and so on. So that, that is the advantage. And again, same system can be used for your HPC and AI uh, workload as well. The, now we have come to quantum supports for multi-node. Uh, so we can go save, as I said, one system, one node can perform up to 36 qubit. To go further qubits, we can have multi-node system uh, and there we can run uh, our 
as many qubits as you desire. And this I am talking about a state vector. TensorNet, which required less memory, here we can go up to 10,000 qubits. Right? Um, as I said, uh, we have tie up with almost all the uh, lead uh, leading partners in the industry. And this offering is available on the cloud also on Amazon Bracket. If you go and uh, would like to run Coo Quantum, that is available. This is some glimpse on the performance. So here what we done is uh, we run the standard algorithm um, or I would say kernel or most commonly used algorithm. They are sure QFT and supremacy. Now here what we done is we shown here the results for one GPU, two GPU card, four GPU card and eight GPU card. One system can have maximum up to eight GPU card which is our DGX AMD. Now and here, uh, we assume the CPU performance is one. And now this, we are showing the relative performance. You can see that finally with the eight GPU, we are getting up to the order of 300 X gain for FFT or QFT algorithm. And this we will see in tutorial also live and so on. Um, as I said, we are going now multi-node. So here we are showing the multi-node weak scaling. Weak scaling means uh, the workload remains same, um, same. So like say, when we use one node, we are showing the results for 32 qubit. We use two node, then uh, we increase the qubit, 32 qubit. So every node has same workload and so on. Now, ideally in this case, the performance should be linear, uh, but up to 35 qubit, it remains linear. And then the, the time increases exponentially. And that is because there is a network overhead. Um, the communication takes significant time. And that's where uh, now we are working on the shared memory system where we have around 256 GPUs in one system. And that's where then you will see the performance will be linear. Right? This is the strong node scaling. So here the execution time decreases as we increase the number of GPUs. And we are showing here um, starting from one GPU to 256 GPU, the execution time decreasing significantly, right? So the, our solution is available for multi-node. And what, what's the comparison in terms of CPU and cluster versus GPU? So if you one has 64 node CPU cluster, there the similar performance or better performance can be achieved with our two DJX A100 system. Um, this is, so far I've shown results for a state vector. This is for tensor. Uh, this is a max cut problem. Here the NVIDIA researchers have worked and uh, further optimized the algorithm. And now we can go up to 10,000 qubit count. Here I'm showing up to 5,000 qubit counts. Um, that is possible on 20 nodes of our system with the 93% accuracy. Not only academic institute, we are working with the many industry giants. So say B, uh, BMW, they are using for path planning and vehicle optimization. Deloitte is working for quantum natural language processing. Um, Johnson & Johnson is working with for carbon capturing um, and VQE. And uh, similarly, Siemens is also working with us for medical image processing and uh, other portfolio optimizations and so on. Um, this is the work done in India. Um, this is work done with Dr. Anandita Bardaji at CDEC. And we use CDEC system. And here we run the same algorithm. Uh, here we try to show our previous generation GPU, which is V100, and the latest generation GPU, which is A100, and the performance gain for Shore, QFT, and Sikimur. The results are shown for 30 qubit, 32 qubit, and 32 qubit, respectively. And these uh, work is published in uh, following two papers. So with that, uh, that is about co-quantum. Now let's move to the next one is hybrid quantum classical computing. Um, as I said, the future is will be hybrid. Part of the algorithm will run on uh, classical computers and uh, a small part of the algorithm will be offloaded on quantum systems. And that's where we need a framework to write a code which makes developers life easy to simply write a code which will today if they write for any investigation tomorrow the same code should easily be ported when actual QPU or quantum processing comes into picture. Right? So 
that's where this uh, CUDA quantum, um, this supports any kind of quantum processing unit, be it uh, ion trapping or be it superconducting, any kind of system. Um, it is compiler for hybrid system. We provide in CUDA quantum, you get compiler as well as the framework. So it, you can easily compile your code as shown in the left-hand side bottom. The classical computer may have the CPU as well as GPU, or we can use the quantum circuit simulation there, and then we can offload part of it onto the quantum system as well. Um, then uh, it is open and interoperable. Uh, any kind of par parallelism is possible, be it OpenMP, MPI, and so on. I will show that. And then single source, C++ and Python programming model that is supports right now. Bottom side is the link given where one can go and look into that more. Again, we are partnered with almost all the leading uh, collaborators into the quantum computing, um, be it regating Microsoft, quantum brilliance, and so on. Right? Um, as I said, it is interoperable. So we uh, standard parallelism, then CUDA, then OpenMP, OpenACC, all kind of language which supports parallelism, they are interoperable with this. Uh, sample code, here we see the above part is offloaded on quantum processing unit and bottom part, which is LU decomposition or LU factorization, which we keep it on classical system because here it, that operation would be faster. So simply we need to define a syntax, CUDA cube and so on, and it will be uh, work and offloaded on quantum system, right? And um, rest will remain on uh, classical system. Uh, we support, as I said, Python and uh, C++ language, uh, sample code is given here. Um, and this is a simple comparison. If we use CUDA quantum framework, how the performance would be on same architecture. We use our latest generation A100 GPU for this calculation. And here the compiler time is the unit. So minimal the time, better the performance. In one case, we use um, CUDA quantum, uh, which is shown the performance shown with the green line. And then another one, we use the Python framework and the performance shown with the purple line. And here you can see that uh, CUDA quantum performs better. And, uh, and execution time, yes. Um, as, uh, some speed up, uh, if we use the CUDA quantum and uh, we see we, if we use for 20 qubits, higher the qubits, better the performance, we get around 300x speed up using our CUDA quantum framework. As I said, it's a compile time. We can define whether we are using simulator or whether we are using actual quantum computer, right? So above, uh, we are showing that minus QP QPU equal to Q quantum, which is a simulator. So it simulates the code or it simulates the code on the uh, simulator using Q quantum, accelerate the performance, the results are there. The right side, we use minus QPU equal to quantum. This is ion-based trap system. And uh, uh, the here we, you see the performance is quite similar and only uh, compile time we change the uh, uh, parameters to run it on actual quantum system. Rest all remain same, your programming coding remains same, no need to change it. That's the advantage. This is with the NVIDIA quantum, we have all leading um, hardware or simulator frameworks or system builder integrators, we are tie up with everyone. Even on cloud service provider, you go on AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, everywhere you will find these offerings. One can utilize those, exploit those capabilities that will benefit, right? And again, as I said, all academic centers also, they are working with us, be it Argon, Gen-C, Julik, um, Oak Ridge, and so on, and Nurse. Um, there again, the beauty is they have HPC plus AI system, classical system, and they are using this quantum software on those systems. So no need to have a special system for this. One system can be used for multiple things. Uh, with this, I would like to move towards my tutorial. I might be a little fast, but keeping in time in view, I am a little fast here. So in tutorial, I will talk about two algorithms, uh, QFT as well as uh, Shore algorithm. 
their code is available. I will demonstrate how to run on the system. As I said, right now I'm showing you on one system, which is GPU enabled, but same system available at CDEC. Any faculty member or anyone would like to use that system, please connect. We, we will uh, work with CDEC and try to provide you the access. So first is, uh, I'm sure no need to talk about the algorithm you might have learned by now, but first one is we are talking about quantum Fourier transform, which is being used extensively in all quantum algorithms, including Shore algorithm. So here I will show how to run the QFT. When we run on CPU, what is the performance? When we run on GPU, what will work? That I will demonstrate. Uh, I'm not going detail about the algorithm because I'm sure by now it might have covered. And same, another important algorithm, we will talk about Shore algorithm and their performance we'll see. Shore is very important as in initial talk, even with Dr. Amrita or C dot or uh, other agency the, in the communication, the Shure algorithm or quantum key uh, in the cryptography domain. This this is a very important algorithm where we, if we can factorize two large prime numbers, that is a risk also, right? So I will show these two algorithms how they are accelerated using Ku quantum on GPU enabled system. So I am switching now to my system. Before that, if I need to take questions, or shall I go on system now? Let me stop sharing and share again my screen. Hope everyone can see my screen. Yeah, no, we can see. We log in. This is one system I have logged in. And, uh, yeah. So before the system is being logged in, I would like to visit this page. As I said, all links were given. This is for Ku Quantum. So anyone can go, even I can paste this link into the chat. Let me paste it so one can look into that if someone is interested. Um, same thing, where is the chat? Um, mm -hmm. No, I'm not finding the chat window. I will, I will paste it, I will share this or someone can copy this link. So this is the, uh, for Ku Quantum, the container form available. In this page, we talk everything, how to pull this Ku Quantum container and how to run with the standard applications are given here. And then I will show you the QFT and other things. Those also can be run here. Those are also available open source. And all the steps are given here, how to download the container and how to access. And then one can inbuild those with their applications and work. So this is the go-to page for every day or researching. So now we are on the system. Uh, just I give a system overview. So this is NVIDIA SMI is a command which shows what kind of GPU we have on the system. So here we have uh, NVIDIA 800 GPUs and we have around 80 GB memory for all the GPUs, right? And we have total eight GPUs on the system. Um, with that, let me download first the container. Uh, so I have the command of the container here. I will walk it through. So I just keep ready the things uh, so that. So what we are doing is we are calling the Docker and here I need to use sudo for Docker. So let me use that. Um, then I'm running the Docker run. I'm asking for all GPUs. I am giving the port number in case if I need to use the notebook, Jupyter notebook. Right now I will show the command line, but one can use. I'm mounting my home path, and then this is the container path. So one can uh, give the password. With that, now I am inside the container. I can use any framework now with this library, with Git, Serp, Penny Lane. Anything I can use, no need to install separately any framework. Right? Now I go to my home directory where I kept my benchmarks. So, um, 
So here I kept my code ready. Those, if required, I can share those. Those are also open source, but let's see what is this. So first I am showing the quantum um, Fourier transform code, right? Um, this is based on CERC framework. So we are importing the CERC library inside this, and that is further front-ended by this. Uh, in this code, we are doing the QFT benchmark and we need certain input parameter. I will talk about that. Uh, with the input parameter only, we will define how we are running the code, be it CPU enabled or be it GPU. So uh, here we need to define for how many qubits we need to run and then uh, what will be the mode. And ideally what happens is it, it takes all these operation, then it runs the uh, QSIM, and then QSIM is already uh, takes the parameter and make it to run it with the GPU enabled or CPU. That circuit takes care of everything. I show you that part also. Uh, like this SIM operation options. So here it in the SIM operation file. Anyone who is doing coding might be aware that make separate file and we pass on the operations. So here we define if code has to run on only on CPU or it could be GPU enabled. And then we, we pass this operation with the QSIM operation. Here we tell them that run it CPU enabled and GPU enabled. User need to define this only. Automatically the GPU enabled takes place and we get the best of this. Right? No need to do further anything on this. So I will not go more details and let me start running the code. So I have the command ready and I explain that for QFT. Right now I will run for the uh, a smaller qubit to save the time because GPU run will be faster as I can show, but CPU run will take longer. Uh, so let's start with say 26 qubit or 28 qubit. Right? Uh, what I'm giving, I'm running this Python, uh, Python code, QFT. Then backend, I am saying it should run on multi GPU, so M GPU. Then I am defining the device number. So as I said, we have eight GPUs. So I am giving this zero, one, two, three, four, or uh, zero to seven. Those numberings on which it should run. Then n uh, n sub is a number of GPU what we are using total. And then I am defining the qubit. And then uh, to benchmark generally we make multiple runs. So I am making here four runs for the same thing and we'll try to take the best performance. I submitted the job for 28 qubit. And uh, let's see. Um, so we, we made four runs and this is the execution time what we are gaining. And this, please note that this is in the millisecond. And I note down this time somewhere. Uh, let's open one Excel sheet. Um, I'm unsure you will be able to see, but let's note down the time. Uh, are you able to see my Excel sheet? No, we're not. Okay. Uh, I'm not switching the window, but I note down the time, final calculation time I will use. So I am taking say 21 this time as a time and I keep it here. It's in millisecond, right? So, before that, we need to make a CPU also. CPU only run also, and then we will compare the performance. So now I take the command for CPU only run, and I put it here. Uh, as I said earlier, we run for 28 qubits. So let's small because CPU run takes long in the interest of time. So what I'm giving this command, how it looks like, this is standard QFT code, which you might be using on Shore and all QFT kernel. You can call the same thing from here. Backend, I'm giving CPU. And then I am for CPU also performance can multi-threaded. Uh, so I'm giving here 64 thread. Those could be 128 or even 256 thread because on this system, we have 128 core. Earlier I run, uh, I get the uh, similar performance with 64, 128, so on, but one can experiment. Right? With that, I am submitting the job. We will see the time. Okay. And certainly these, right now I am demonstrating the code. These performance can be further optimized for CPU and for GPU, but notional I am showing that what it will be and how. So here, if you take, it's a 16 second. 
and here it's a 21 millisecond. If we compare this performance, you will see it's a significant number of, I mean, multi, multi X improvement. Certainly we can improve the CPU performance and GPU performance also with some bindings and other things, which I'm not doing now. This is notional what I'm showing that even if you run without any binding, without any optimization environment, you get that much number of, uh, I mean, that much speed up when you use this system. And the beauty is same system can be used for anything. So say I take nine seconds uh, and then here I take 21 millisecond. And if I try to find the ratio between those, uh, let me share my Excel sheet uh, and then show. So those are, uh, this one is the GPU time. I'm just comparing for this. And uh, this is uh, CPU time. What we are gaining is around nine seconds. This is in seconds, right? So to convert in millisecond, we need to multiply it by thousand. So I am doing the calculation here. This multiplied by thousand divided by GPU time with eight GPU what we are getting. And I need to remove the millisecond. It will be the problem. Yeah. So, so this is around 400 something time X. Certainly we can get CPU time a little better with some binding, memory binding and more threads and GPU time also may improve. So Ideally, we say it's around 300x, but just now I run the code for 28 qubits and it is showing that we increase the qubits, we gain the better performance. And that's the beauty here, same system. Uh, you might have access to any GPU enabled system and you can try these simulations, right? Uh, is there a time to run another code, sure algorithm, or that's enough? Just would like to know from Anandita or anyone. Um, I think you can go on, but I am not sure as the time is already. I mean, yeah, that's what I One code I show, I can do the similar thing with show algorithm and show the performance. But happy to take question more rather than doing this. Or if someone that wants, I can one. demonstrate that. Yeah. You can also. Hi, Manish. Hello. Hi. Hi, uh, Dr. Manjana. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for this nice uh, presentation and demo on this. So uh, we want to say like we are a quantum solutions provider. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we take access through, I mean, work through bracket uh, systems and this, we integrate our solution with this, right. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we, we provide our own SDK framework like this that mm -hmm. can run on bracket device. So like a penny lane kind of framework, which we mm -hmm. build for our customer. So how can we build such thing using Q quantum? Uh, uh, so penny lane, there is a link I will share in chat. Now chat I am seeing. So I will paste here the link. Penny lane already a blog is written. How to access penny lane with Q quantum? Detailed blog is there, and uh, that on AWS bracket also the same thing is available. Yeah, no, that I understand. But we are building something like penny lane for a very specific application in optimizing okay. machine learning. How do we directly access Q quantum so that we can provide to our clients through that? So as I said, Q quantum is freely available. One hmm. can download the container. Now we need to see your algorithm inside Ku Quantum, which algorithm you are using. If that is not there, we need to provide the library. You are saying you are developing in house something. Yes. Right, like Penny Lane. Yes. So that we need to work to provide that in Ku Quantum. We can work together or uh, we can enable you and then you can write your own. That's not a problem. Both ways possible. Sure. Okay. Uh, that was like in the partnership or some mode that is yeah. possible. Right, for possible, possible. Yeah, we are open as as I said, NVIDIA almost all the software open source and community contribute that more and that's great. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Any other question? Yeah, I have one question. Uh, sure. clarification. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, how one can build hybrid algorithms meant for quantum computers without having interface requirements for quantum computers? Interface requirement, can you elaborate that, sir? Uh, I mean, uh, you don't know uh, which inputs, outputs are required for quantum computer, right? 
So how uh, one can build that? You mean input high... output means generally, I mean, can you elaborate? I mean, so what we are doing is we are giving a framework where code particular algorithm portion of the algorithm, like my previous speaker shown optimization algorithm or pathfinding algorithms that we know mm -hmm. particular portion of the algorithm should run on quantum with the qubit conversion and so on and so on. So our frameworks may ensure that that can easily be offloaded on quantum. A compiler, when it compiles, it tells uh, in binary it instrument in a way that that portion of the code is executed on the quantum. And now communication between classical and quantum takes care using CUDA quantum framework. And then there certainly will be the, uh, uh, what you say, the latency and other signals and other electronics will come into picture. So same we we are with the quantum machines, we are doing the similar things. And we are yeah. developing so those logics and all. Yeah. So maybe I should specify the mapping. You see one field you have uh, in uh, in your classical computer and another mm -hmm. field uh, in quantum computer. So how you are going to map uh, those ones so that quantum computer can understand? Yes, this is what- Yeah, th those uh, logics are being created. There are many uh, players into that, like uh, quantum okay. machines. They are giving only the circuits or logics and all. We tie up with them that supports our CUDA framework, CUDA quantum frameworks. Okay. And I, I believe you are asking how to translate bit into qubits and then take back. And that, that is one kind of thing you are asking, right? One of the uh, questions. Yes, but uh, even uh, usually uh, when you um, um, develop a software, then uh, if you want to connect to that, to, an, to another software, you need some interface between yes. two softwares. Yes. yes. So he, here I am just uh, trying to understand what kind of interface may be if we don't know even uh, whether which quantum computer we are going to use or whether it is standard st standard approach or it is not non-standard approach. So I, I don't know. No, no, fair question, sir. And what we are seeing is our CUDA quantum framework, we are integrating with all available other standard quantum computers frameworks, right? So right now, what we are suggesting that our developers should bother up to CUDA quantum and interface and interconnect with the other thing that will be taken care by software and compile. But it will be there. And if you have particular software, then those details can be shared. With. I mean, if user is ready with one kind of software, then certainly we can share those details, how the interface is there. But this is okay. open. I mean, every quantum has a different kind of software and all. So we are working with all the players and making it portable across the all kind of uh, systems and software ecosystem. Okay, it's clear now. Thank you. Uh, I had one more question, Manish. Uh, sure. Just so um, as uh, during the development phase, like you mentioned that uh, in the presentation. It, uses only DGX to run, can't we use uh, uh, the other uh, GPUs uh, processor cores, for example, A ATX, I think 3080, uh, 3080 so cores. Those are graphics card, as I said, our CUDA runs there. So all this software okay. should run, okay. but performance not guaranteed. Yeah, but for the development wise. Uh, it uh, depends a... now which firmware and all we are supporting from V hundred onwards. So if your generation is even older than that, then this quantum won't support it. Um, but uh, if your generation is latest, you can try even on your laptop also. Not a problem with uh, any okay. graphics card. So, yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, because we have a server module and we want to do this hybrid jobs uh, yeah. with, with the CUDA, uh, with the Q quantum. Uh, is, is it doable? So, in such a... It is doable. The problem will come is, uh, you know, there's qubits are memory hungry. Yes. And if your graphics card is not enough memory, then it will be a problem. So it all depends what kind of memory you have on the graphics card. Is one example. The... Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah. You can continue. So one example I show here is I shown in that on Param Siddhi, or now we call it as a Arawat system, what is available at CDAC. There, each graphics card has a 40 GB memory. Okay. One, one DJX has an eight card. So total 14 to 8, 320 GB memory. With that, we can go up to 32 qubits. Okay. But if we double the memory, 80, Q, 80 GB on same system, we can go up to 36 qubits. Okay. So the qubits are always 
particularly straight vector is memory hungry, I should say in that way. Uh, if it's a tensor, then we, are, we do not require that much memory. Okay, so you're talking only memory of the GPUs. What about memory of this RAM, uh, CPU? So, for example, in a server system, we have seven uh, uh, a huge RAM uh, aspects, right? Like more than uh, 256 or 512 GB RAM in a server. Yeah. So, yeah. can yeah. We also support that one? No, but then your so what is happening is where I am saying if to see the performance gain, everything should be remain on GPU. Okay. If you do communication between CPU and GPU, you won't see the performance gain then it will be the penalty rather it is communicating between CPU and that will be the penalty. Okay. So are there any more questions? Um, I have a small question. Uh, what was the means you showed uh, us two times one in the micro microsecond uh, scale and one in the second scale. So what are the significance of both those time? I, can't, I couldn't update it. So the execution time of the code is given in seconds and microseconds. And generally uh, how we compare the speed up CPU time divided by GPU time, those many X is the performance gain. So what I did is compare this, uh, convert the seconds into the microseconds, then made them same unit and then compare the ratio. That's what I did. Okay, so it can be used as a, a metric to, you know, compare performances. That, is that yes, what that's what generally what, how we compare the time taken on one system and time taken on another kind of system. And then we compare them by relative performance, right? Does that make sense? Same page? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so to uh, compare that, we need to have same units. Hence, I converted seconds into microseconds, milliseconds. Okay, okay. So, are there any more questions? Uh, can I ask one more question? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, in quantum mechanics, we use tensor products quite often between subsystems. And dimension of matrix uh, for finding eigenfunctions and eigenvalues be becomes problematic because you need more uh, computer uh, hardware resources. So are there any algorithms uh, which can be used to uh, speed up uh, such kind of um, uh, problems of finding eigenfunctions and eigenvalues and then multiplying uh, each other, having huge, huge numbers, right? Okay. Huge sizes. Yeah, we, so there are two, three ways. If you are solving the matrix and those are memory hungry, then certainly it will take time. But then we have come up with the max cut that, uh, that paper I can share with you. It's openly available. If you see max cut plus NVIDIA, you will get a paper. We developed a new algorithm where we required less memory and that's where we can scale the problem and we, we could get, uh, I mean, performance scaled significantly. So there are many kind of uh, people have played around with the max cut problem with the tensor and they try to come up with the answer. So you may refer a few papers here. that will help. Otherwise I, I can connect with you offline and show you how to work on that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Usually I use uh, uh, Fortran uh, uh, algorithms. Yeah. Uh, I am also a photon coder, sir. No worries. <laughs> okay. So, so I will show may, you. Yeah. May, maybe I thought that uh, some new approaches uh, have been appeared and uh, so that will there be... are many. Uh, I mean, it it's a common problem that matrix solving and finding eigenvalue and when matrix are huge. Now, ten yeah. to, for this cryptography and all people are talking about ten to power six by six or ten to yeah. power nine by ten to power nine matrix. Yeah. So in Fortran, declaring even array with that 10 to the power 9 is a challenge. We can't declare mm -hmm. an array with the 10 to the power 9. Even you do max stake and you limit whatever you do. Uh, you mm -hmm. can't declare that. So that's an uh, issue. Yeah. You're trying to solve that. Yeah. Okay. So max cut will help in reducing the, the memory the... footprint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. 
So I think what what sorry what about the tensor networks? So whether one can use tensor networks to uh, and maybe that will help to reduce the uh, this issue with the size of the matrix. No, not with the size memory requirement. Tensor uh, tensor products will okay. So some not contraction of indices maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, not with the size. Okay, size will remain, but some recipes will yeah. be there, yeah. which will help. Okay, so thank previous you. Previous state you need to keep or not. If you go with the state vector, we keep all the states, right? And that's where mm -hmm. it's a memory only, and that's where we say max cut can go up to certain limit, 50. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But tensor can go up to 10,000. No. Oh, thank, thank you. Same, same available system. Yeah. Okay, uh, any other questions? I have another meeting now at eight o'clock. So uh, quickly, if one or two more questions, then I can take otherwise. So I think we can uh, conclude the session is already been a one hour detail. So I would thank, I would like to thank Dr. Manish Modani for this wonderful tutorial session. And thanks, uh, thanks everyone yeah. for giving me a chance. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And I would also like to thank all the speakers and participants for being here. It's been a wonderful session. Mm. On concluding, I would like um, Dr. Anandita to means, uh, take over and say something. She may. I think she's not uh, around, I think so. So I think we can uh, end the session here. And uh, our next, uh, from the next week, we can, we have, we'll have our uh, researchers meet starting where all, where we will, you know, showcase the uh, works of researchers all around the world. So we'll see you on, from the next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.